This meeting of the School Board of Alachua County is called to order. Welcome to the January 19th meeting of the School Board. Will everyone please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point, we'd like to have adoption of the agenda, and before we do that, I'm going to uh, let you know that we are pulling from consent H12. Mr. Cottle will uh, come at a different time to share with us, so please uh, pull that. And also under action, just a minute. H what else? Eight, eight. Eight? Okay. Also, H8. Yes. Madam Chair, is that for further consideration? And also, um, action item one, the employee case. Those will be pulled. So we have H12, H8, and I, an action item one. Yes, Mr. Hyatt. Uh, is, is item H8, is that pulling all together or we're we pulling that for, for specific consideration? I had a question. Had a question about it, so I wanted to pull it just to add it down to action item. Yeah, or or it, it, at that particular time, Ms. Neal can address it possibly. Either one is fine with me. <coughs> okay. Hearing. Does that satisfy you, Mr. Hyatt? Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. With that, may I, ha um, I saw Attorney Delaney. I, I think it's clear enough, but just in case there was any doubt, it sounds like Board Member Certain um, has a point of clarification regarding H8. What our rules say is if, if there's a relatively brief point of clarification, we go ahead and handle it on the regular consent agenda. If it needs to be pulled for discussion back and forth, maybe other board members need to weigh in, then we should probably drop it down to the action item. What's your druthers, Mrs. Surgeon? For clarity, just drop it to the action item, Madam Chair. I couldn't hear you. For clarity purposes, drop it to action item. I think that'll be okay. easy because both myself. All right, and so I'm then that will be action item. Let's see. Six. We can move it to where, um, two, if that's okay, where we move the uh, employee's case. Is that okay, Attorney Delaney? Yes, ma'am. Okay, all right. There a motion to adopt the agenda with the said. Um, so moved. Second. It has been promptly moved and seconded. Any other discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion passes 5-0. At this point, I'd like to have the approval of our minutes. July 21st, 2020, school board meeting, and I guess we could do both at the same time, um, the special meeting. So moved, Madam Chair. It has been promptly moved and seconded in any discussion. Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Ms. Dr. Simon, before we do the updates, um, or would you prefer to have the administrative appointment after the updates or 
based on um, the audience, yes, I would think mm -hmm. it would actually be a very good idea to move it sooner than later because um, our right. updates are intensive, and so I see some. I think our youngest I, members I, would appreciate yes, that, and I see some beautiful little ones. Uh -huh. So, um, with that, uh, Dr. Simon, would you please continue with the administrative appointment? So, I have the honor of. Um, appointing Chris Beelan as the principal of Talbot Elementary. I'd like to read his bio and then I will ask that he can come and just say a few words and hopefully introduce his family. Chris Beelan is a proud lifelong resident of Alachua County. He attended Glen Springs, Westwood, PK Young and Buholtz. He then went on to receive three degrees from the University of Florida including his doctoral degree in leadership and educational administration in 2016. He also recently earned the UF graduate certificate in dyslexia. Dr. Bielan taught second, third, and fifth grade at Talbot and Meadowbrook Elementary School for nine and a half years. He was then a behavior resource teacher for two years and assistant principal for three years at Meadowbrook. Dr. Bielan has been the assistant principal at Williams Elementary School for the past two and a half years. He is married to his wife, Katie, and has four daughters, and now he is returning back to Talbot Elementary. Would you mind saying a few things? Thank you so much, Dr. Simon, uh, Deputy Superintendent uh, Ms. Jones, um, Dr. McNeely, and board members. Um, it's an honor to be the principal of Talbot. I just want to give two shout outs first to Williams Elementary. I've been there. This was my third year, and I love Williams. A great community, and so, I'm excited for the opportunity for Talbot, and then just want to thank my mentors, Yana Stokes, Principal of Williams, and Brad Berkley. And then here's my family, my wife Katie, my four girls, we're breaking bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, my mom, my sister, and my brother. So thank you again. Before, before we do anything else, we should at least push this vote on through. So may I have a motion at this time? Oh, so moved. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Can I say go? And um, the motion passes. Dr. Bielan, congratulations. And Dr. Paulson mm -hmm. would have a word. Yeah, but well, I see your mom here today, who's an ex media specialist at Westwood, right? And I know she's proud. And your dad, well, I, I think you know your dad was on my doctoral committee. And you look like your dad, too. <laughs> so I'm sure he's so proud of you, too. I mean, it's, a, it's a great thing when you see your, your son raise up and be, be successful like this. So congratulations. Thanks for doing it. Any other comments? All right, Mrs. Surton. Dr. Beelan, um, congratulations to you. Good to see all of your girls. I've asked you about them, and we often talk when I'm visiting over at Williams. And kind of a sad day for Williams, but um, I guess a happy day for, um, for Talbot for them to get you as a leader. I wish you all the best. Um, would hope that there would still be collaboration and a work to, um, with you and between you and Ms. Stokes and the staff at Williams to continue the good work in the county and to help lift up Williams as well in your departure. Thank you for your service and congratulations again. Dr. Beelan, I just want you to know that um, you're headed to fill some other shoes, I'm certain, but um, you are not going to be on autopilot and there's much work to be done and I know, and I know that you will get all of it completed. I am so happy for you and can't wait to visit with you at Talbot. Congratulations. Dr. McNeely, yes. I was hoping I could have a, just a moment to explain um, Ms. Dell and um, the, the position a bit more so the general public has an understanding. Okay. Thank you. So um, because of this, the transition from the decision of the last, the special board meeting with the um, Twilliger moving to school I as a transition space, Ms. Dell, who was 
Talbot's previous principal, she had been intended to go to School I, but due to Talbot's uh, students moving to School I, Miss Dell actually in a quite it's a woman. Or, sorry, Twilliger. <laughs> so Tw Twilliger is moving to School I. Miss Dell is actually going to work with us to help us with uh, quite a few things. She's going to help prepare School I for Twilliger's students. So that's going to be a process, just making sure that the school is prepared as well as we're help using her assistance to help us with the semester conversion to support our principals. And then what we're also hoping is that Ms. Dell really will become a principal in a special assignment to help with uh, building our bench of leadership and supporting our practicing principals. We have a, uh, a group of younger principals who could really benefit and appreciate um, Ms. Dell's expertise. And then it has turned out uh, not really anticipated, but it turned out to be a nice ex need for us to be filled that with the COVID quarantine component, we have actually benefited from Ms. Dell serving as a, a pinch hitter uh, when we have a principal or an administrator of some sort who needs to actually quarantine for COVID. So she's, she's really helping us on many levels and she seems to be excited about the new work. And so I think it, this has worked out quite well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Simon. To the Beelan family, <laughs> um, you are more than welcome to continue to be with us, but I think you mentioned earlier about bedtime. Bedtime. <laughs> They're adorable. Oh, they are. <laughs> Mr. Purvis, you've already <laughs> stepped up. I don't even have to call your name for the first update. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> if you're ready, Madam Chair, board members, Madam Superintendent, we are just going to present an HR update of where we stand for recruiting and just some informational and answer any questions we can. On your, at the dais, you should see a folder uh, for you to look at that looks like this. And I apologize if I'm over teaching. Um, and then there's a lot of information in there about teacher certification, brochures, handout cards. You see a bus handout card uh, and where you can test for the testing information. So depending on whatever job fair we're on, uh, we load those folders with that pertinent information as we go through. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about non-instructional. So currently, non-instructional vacancies as we stand today is uh, you can see that on the list right there. We have about six pair of ones. Pair of two instructional as we sit today is 36. And even with the spring assurances, we could possibly add some more. Uh, behavioral paras, bus attendants, food and nutrition, custodian, maintenance and operations, clerical, and bus drivers is a continuous posting. So a total as it stands today is 81 vacancies. And as you know, that in HR, that information is fluid day by day as, as we run through it. Some talent acquisition, the things that we do to try to fill our non-instructional positions. First of all, many of you know that we do the pair pro testing for ACPS employees. It is free for employees on their first attempt. We provide them study guides. We actually house this and do this. Sometimes it's downstairs, but with COVID, we've been using a larger computer lab. And we've seen a lot of success, not a 60% pass rate, but everybody that does pass it gets promoted. So it has been successful offering that uh, to employees. All the time we're assisting with applications, the interview process, we're calling applicants in to assist with interview. We facilitate interviews for them for positions they're qualified as well. In the past, and unfortunately COVID is kind of stop some of the things. We did the paraprofessional town hall at Spring Hill Baptist, which has been very um, beneficial for us. And maybe we can look at trying to do that in the spring as we move forward. <coughs> we have phone and Zoom supports available. Virtual is a good thing. And so we can still reach out to people. We're very excited about working with the city of Gainesville and the Gainesville Housing Authority is offering a job fair next week and we've already submitted that. We'll be there for a 20 minute block and it's all virtual. 
And most of you already know that we send flyers throughout the community, including where we get a lot of assistance is the faith-based organizations. They post those and we get some applicants responding uh, to that information. Also, just some more updates, transportation job fairs. We did one in September. We're having one upcoming in January and we'll schedule another one in March going through that process. You saw all in the folder, we have the specialty card information and we can tailor that to whatever we're looking for, such as transportation. We do the typical billboards, radio, ACPS, marquees, and TV advertising. We have a custom, customized video highlighting all non-instructional positions in our district, and that is on our recruitment page, which I'll show you in a minute. And we're doing the social media, the Facebook, the Twitter, the handshake. We're offering that as well for people trying to reach a lar larger group of, of applicants. The qualifications at a glance for paraprofessionals, and I won't read through all this, for a para one general, it's a high school diploma, minimum of one year successful clerical or aid experience. Para two is a high school diploma. And para one and two instructional, they have to have a high school diploma, <coughs> diploma, minimum of 60 college credit hours, or the para pro that I mentioned earlier in order to be um, qualified for that position. Moving to instructional. Here is our retention data from 1920. And as you can see at the bottom, our overall percent returned is 84% when we captured that data. So we had a 16% attrition, which is close, a little bit lower than we normally uh, hold. But obviously COVID has you know, offered people an opportunity to retire early, to leave for COVID, whatever the reason. Most of the people that do a separation, just they just mark personal. Here's the retention data by race. You have that information right there and you can see just overall race, what the retention data is. The next slide was very interesting uh, when we looked at it. Uh, at this same time frame, the last three years, we've had about the same number of classroom positions available. I'm just talking about classroom teachers, just not overall positions. We thought that was interesting that even in this turmoil, our principals, uh, public, anybody out there trying to get teachers or whatever, they're out there and people are still working. And we're, we were, you know, we still want to fill 19, but in relation, we felt, okay, that was better than what we had hoped and thought. Instructional vacancies as of this morning. So you can see in the elementary classroom, two primary, three intermediate. ESC is five elementary, Title I intervention is three, and elementary art is two. And so we have 15 classroom vacancies at this juncture. And we just put a comparison of where, uh, oh, sorry, where other districts were at. Marion County is obviously very close. Leon is comparable and Clay is right across the way. This does not include obviously your BRTs, media specialists, and uh, school counselors. Some people have asked, what does it take to become a teacher? So you must be certified in one of the 39 state certifiable subjects. And they have a list of that for you to look at. Uh, for initial three year non-renewable temporary cert, must have a bachelor's degree in one of the 39 state subjects or bachelor's degree and pass a subject area exam, exam in one of the 39 state certifiable subjects. Little information about the five year professional, you still need to pass the general knowledge, professional exam, subject area, as well as some continuing education requirements. What we do for talent acquisition for instructional, we're doing the in person, the phone, on demand Zoom sessions to assist candidates. Application screening, which we're doing that continuously. We look at resumes interviewing assistance and when we find people that are qualified we send those to principals especially the ones that are looking for jobs now certification information ongoing all the time and assistance the intern appreciation boxes i remember telling uh, the board before the holidays we did the stitch fix boxes and so this is the only one left so you can't have one unless you want it of course Dr. Menil. and we had a lot of things in there for teachers shirt stickers brochures Umbrellas, you name it. You can't return it though. Uh, 
We do the college class presentations. We're working with UF. We want to get in front of our interns. We sent this to all of our interns that we currently had before <coughs> the holidays. Uh, doing workshops with the Career Work Resource Centers, radio and TV advertisement. Marquees is a huge success for us, and we do that for non-instructional as well. So we're greatly appreciative of our um, district facilities and schools when they put that up. The typical social media print, the online recruitment, we're doing Handshake, HBCU Connect, Diversity in Ed, the Teacher of Color. We advertise on Santa Fe's college job board. We're doing the tutoring program that cranks up here in a couple of weeks where we pay stipends for those in particular that need to get that professional certification test done. We pay them stipends to come in to help to defray the cost of those exams. And that's virtual, it'll start in a couple of weeks, like I said. We were excited about this and we mentioned it, the Pearson Testing Center pilot program. We're the only one in the state of Florida school district wide that is offering that. Uh, as of the last count that Mr. Wise provided, we've had 220 participants, but that's not all ACPS employees. So now we're gonna go back and circle around and see, start tracking ACPS. But 220, and we started November 3rd, we only offer it two days a week, is uh, pretty outstanding. Uh, the phone, the Zoom assistance, screenings, the reimbursement program, we're doing the reading reimbursement. We've been very successful, over 200 teachers, so we pay them the $150 once they show us a passing test, and so no money out of their pocket, out of their pocket and we reimburse them. We got the friendlier web addresses that you can see, and that was, came from uh, IT, we're excited about that. Job fairs, information that we've done and fixing to come through. You can see those, Gainesville Housing Authority, Florida A&M, HBCU, Teacher Fair, a lot of these fairs are virtual. Teacher of Color Job Fair, January 30th virtual. Great Florida Teach-In, ACBS Teacher Recruitment Job Fair. We're gonna look at trying to host that at GHS. I'm working with UF, Bethune Cookman, Florida Fund for Minority Teachers in March. And things that we're working on and in progress. We have a dashboard, it's called the Human Capital Portfolio, working with NEFEC. Uh, Mr. Shankour put this together. We were really excited about it. We have a lot of districts in NEFEC. All of them were using it. Uh, we looked like we were gonna roll that out for the 2021 school year, but unfortunately, February, March, COVID hit, priorities changed. But it's a dashboard for our principals that's on demand that shows attendance, certifications, et cetera, et cetera, for employees. So we're steady working on that and revising that. We're trying to put a lead generator on the ACPS website for resume submission. Basically, it looks like a chat box. You can click on it, submit your resume. We're trying to, trying to get that up and running. Continue to work on our social media content, working on our grow your own options. Obviously, we have the AFT program at GHS. And to continue to work with UF College of Ed. We met with them last week or a couple weeks ago, talked about interns, and then looking at some research and other what other districts are doing of how we can work with interns and go ahead and sign them on and how we can get them working for us earlier. And the last thing I need, a couple things I'd like to show, if hopefully this is up and running. So here's a snippet we've been working, we've been working with Cox Cable for a recruitment video, and here's just a 20 second snippet that we wanted to show you. Uh, Miss Nunn's been working with Cox Cable, going to schools, getting all kind of videos, and we'll roll it out obviously when it gets completed. promise it'll be longer than 20 seconds and then on our recruitment page we've had this up and going the whole time we have videos just for the transportation that's been up there and we've readjusted we have why teaching in Lotchwood County we have all of our job fair flyers on there and, and needed information for people and we've had that recruitment page going a while and trying to update that so with that are there any questions that I can uh, help answer I'm going to start all the way to the left. 
Um, I'm not sure who's D, who's D. D. Oh, Dwayne. All right. So I, so Attorney Delaney, your light is on. Okay. All right. Dr. Paulson and then um, Mrs. Certain and then Mrs. McGraw. How much are we coordinated with our staffing allocation form we're supposed to get every month? We, we're supposed to get a staffing allocation form, or uh, a, a, another thing from the, uh, but the staffing allocation is supposed to tell us how many hires we have, how many we've approved, et cetera. They have it for ESPs and for- Yes, sir. So uh, if you talk about the allocations that we do in March and April for- No, the every month. I'm not aware we're of that. We're supposed to have that since, we've had, we've had it since 2000, when I first got on the board, the first thing I wanted. But I don't know, and Alex, how close is that, Alex, to being active, especially in this time? But. If I may, um, I believe you're talking. The staffing to allocation. The, right, so we do a budgeted staff, um, staffing vacancy report that we send to the board once a month that shows the budgeted uh, positions, filled positions, and vacancies. And it's also furthermore separated by funding source. Um, just looking cursory at the numbers, Kevin, uh, Mr. Purpose presented, they seem to be pretty close in line. Uh, it really just depends on the funding source and certain positions could have been budgeted um, that are not actively being posted, et cetera. Right, I just wanted to see, because we've had this so we know what we've approved, how many vacancies we have. And, uh, we have it for general fund and for Special fund, right? Yeah. The, the only difference is there's going to be a, a discrepancy for sure between what's posted be um, through fast track and, and on the HR website, and then also um, differences in paperwork and just the general timelines. But they're pretty close. Right. Well, that's why I wanted. Right. We also have a fund balance every month with it. Right. That shows us how we're doing with our money. Right. That's actually in and reference what we're doing to that, with our budget. It's yeah. on the agenda tonight. Um, one of the budget, the general fund budget, yep. But it's something we can look up with. It's, it's, on, it's under your your division in the uh, website, right? Correct. And it's got the, in fact, it's got both those names you can click on. But we used to get a paper one. I, you know, I'm old fashioned. I mean, my, back when we started this, I got on the board in 2010. That's the first thing I asked for. So it's a, it's a good way to keep track of it. Yes, sir. And we'll be happy to I guess this is copy. great right here. I mean, what you're doing. This is great. I was just wondering again how close it is and accurate. And it, it lets us know as board members you know, when the, how many units we've approved, etc. Agreed. I, what I can answer from HR, Dr. Paulson, is before, if there's any allocations, obviously I'm talking to Alex to see if there's any allocation changes at schools or anything like that. Yes, yeah, I'd like to get that back, getting that paper copy. Would that be all right? Yes, sir. I mean. I was thinking about it just the other day. Funny about that. But this, this is good. Okay. All right, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Dr. Hulse and Mrs. Surgeon. Dr. McNeely, I didn't have a question. I think the confusion is Dr. Paulson is sitting between where I used to sit and where Dr. <laughs> Mr. Delaney, and both lights are on. Do I'm good. Doc, uh, Dr. Tang, my light is on. Uh, who are, are you, TC? No, uh, no, no. I don't know who I am. We need to, maybe we could get Dr. <laughs> McNeely's uh, um, labels updated. All right, I see an LM, that's my old one. That's me. That's you, that's all right, me. all right. Go ahead, Mr. Hyatt. Uh, thank, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. And um, if you all will turn your lights off, that would help too. Um, I, I wanted to say when, 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 he, when we see all of what's happening here, that's like a full-time job. But that's just a part of what HR is doing. And you and and um, I think the fact that even with COVID, and even uh, with 
uh, you know, not the friendliest folks in the world in, in our state capital. Um, you and your team are, are turning over every stone looking for teachers, looking for uh, paras, looking uh, uh, ESPs, and, and uh, I really appreciate that because I, I think you know that there's no one way to do it. If we don't go to every possible avenue, we're going to miss people. And, uh, I, and I, I really appreciate the thoroughness and the, certainly your leadership. I know you will deflect all that to your team, but I, so I, I, do, I just wanted to say I appreciate what everyone is doing. This is critical uh, and important. What, what does it always come back to? It always comes back to what's good for children. And we've got to have the best people we can have. And, um, and j just the fact that we're close to the numbers we have been, uh, I think that's a good sign. Is it where, is it where we want to be? No, we want to fill all those positions with the best people. But um, I, I've just wanted to go on record as saying thank you and thank the entire HR team for, for the very hard work. And I know it will continue to pay off. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam uh -huh. Chair. If Thank I may, you. Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt. <laughs> Madam Chair, yeah, I have a couple of a few questions, uh, Mr. Purvis. Um, for one, do we, we have a Pacific minority recruiter that goes out and recruit on behalf of this of, of Alachua County? We have a recruiter, and we do target a, a lot of historically black colleges and a minority recruiting. Yes, mm -hmm. in my office we do. Now, is she just only for, for minorities? Mm -hmm. No, ma'am. Okay. Um, the incentive packet, what, what is our incentive packet like? So why would I want to come to Alachua County? What is the incentive packet like? So our incentive package is obviously whenever we complete salary negotiations, we're you know in the 20s for teacher salaries. You live in the community of Alachua, with, with Alachua County, which is a family community. We're going to sell you on our schools. We're mm -hmm. going to sell you on our kids. Mm -hmm. And when, once we can get them in the door and principals hire, those principals do a great job of submitting the, creating the culture of their school and keeping people involved. And we reach out everywhere. But really, we, I've, I've said it, our mm -hmm. biggest deal is we get local. Mm -hmm. you, know, it's, you know, people you know, start talking about, well, they want to compare Atlanta to Gainesville. Well, there's no comparison. Mm -hmm. They're, they got millions of people. You know, we don't have that. But we do a good job and go out. And so, and if there's places that we're not having success, mm -hmm. we'll keep reaching it. But then, if we're not having success, we stop. Mm -hmm. And we move to something else where we can get some success. Okay, well, I get, you know, and, and I do it. I know we don't have tonight in the board meeting, but there are some things that we can do uh, to make sure, because I've checked with some of the other colleges um, University of Florida, that's, that, that's great. I'm not knocking that, but there are other things that we can do outside the box because we want to make sure, as you said, my concern is making sure we have the best uh, in our classroom and what that packet looks like. And when you, just like with the video, when you get ready to do the video, there should be some great testimonies because the, the, the marketing piece helps you draw people, but I know we have to come to a level um, where we can be a little bit more competitive uh, because, you know, we, and, and, and I'm from Gainesville, and I'm here about the children, mm -hmm. but if I can continue to only pick in Gainesville, am I still reaching the best? And so that's what my concern, because at the end of the day, it's about the children. Um, and one of the other things I really want to look at, because and as you said, in other counties, they have HR, but they have a minority recruiter, because we're trying to meet the needs of all, and they have, a, and they have another recruiter. And so sometimes, as he said, and Mr. Hyatt said, it's a lot in HR, but sometimes we have to make sure we channel to certain things, because my concern is, even wouldn't, we can talk about this later, substitutes. Um, how many substitutes have we had for a long period of time in Kelly Services? So, some, so those are some of the things that maybe you and I can get together and you can share that information with me later, but I do think that when it comes to HR, uh, there are some other things, some ideas that I have that I, that I want to share so that we can make sure we are getting apples, oranges, bananas and getting it all. Thank sure. you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, uh, Mrs. McGraw. Um, Mr. Purvis, I know that you have here great Florida teaching, so I would imagine that that would encompass 
all of the other universities and colleges in Florida other than Bethune, Cookman, and um, Florida A&M. Yes, um, because I'm looking at Florida Memorial, uh, Edward Waters. I don't know if those colleges still have strong, viable uh, colleges of ed, but I would certainly say reach out to them. Now, I know funding is a problem. However, um, we may need to put this show on the road. And um, there what, once was a time when I was a principal, you invited principals to attend and go out of town with you, we still and, do. you yes, and you still do yes, that? I didn't, I missed that then. Right, I didn't mention it here, but we still do, and now they're just kind of virtual, most of them, but yes, ma'am, we've, oh, done, sure, that. I we've know. done that since I've been up here for sure, and I know they did it before. Right, I, I, I know that we're not doing any of that right. now that we are virtual, but I was thinking maybe once yes, we get semi-normal again, that um, maybe that would be um, on the table, but if you're already doing that, it's no need to add that. And we're doing it virtual, so what they do in virtual, and I don't mean to interrupt you, Dr. Mead, it's like, we try to put the principals in 30 minute segments. Hey, can you give us 30 minutes? Even if you're, instead of traveling, you're at your office and you can sit there and people that kind of come up, you can talk and discuss with them. Okay, <clears throat> wonderful. Do you have a record of Mrs. Finley of how many of the students that attend um, Grow Your Own at Gainesville High School? How many of those we should have been in place long enough now that we should have some graduates coming back do we, we have any? We haven't had any yet. We haven't had any yet because this, this should be the third year I'm here and it was really so we should have some maybe coming out this year and so that's what we're trying to look at and track that back. Okay. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paulson. Yeah. I, uh, excuse me for having to leave because I'm stupid enough that I don't have my mask. So. And uh, if I ask something still, going over, still got I apologize. It up. It's, um, the parents, is that the parent protest that they have to have to be highly effective? Highly qualified for yeah. a parent two or a parent one instructional, yes, sir. Right, because I used to, we taught that at ACA. We taught 180 parents one year. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, conditions, you talk about what do we have to plan, what do we have to offer. It just so happen I've got these things here. We probably are. Um, most of the counties in North Florida don't pay as well as well as us. Um, counties where, besides being 21st in the state pay, counties like Duval, Clay, St. John's, who has the beach, all those, St. John's average salary is over $1,000 north of us. Um, Clay County, same. Marion County is $3,000 average salary less than us. Columbia, 4000 Levy, of course they're not as big as those other ones, they're 5,000. Pasco, that's a big county. They are $5,000 less than us in average salary. Those, so that's good. We have good working conditions. I hate that, you know, people in Marion County, I don't like what I say here, but we have planning for our teachers. Marion County doesn't. They, they're planning, they, they have to be working. So we teach six periods, five, Five, uh, five classes. If you teach an extra period in this county, it's not hourly rate. It's not uh, one. It's not divided by the number of periods. Divided by the number of periods you're supposed to teach. So if you teach a class in a high school here, six periods, you get and you teach an extra period, you get one fifth, twenty yes, percent. If you're at Hawthorne or Lofton. It's one third. 33. And that's no other place in the state. Our elementary school teachers have the most planning of any elementary school teachers in the state, period. And, and we kept that early Wednesday for them, too. So we have, I think, good working conditions. And I just thought I'd take a chance to uh, and, and brag about what we do here. It is, it's a good place to work. And, um, and the benefits. Huh? Benefits. Benefits. Yeah, we pay 100%. We pay 100% if you work four hours or more. And nobody does that. It's, it's, uh, 
So we, we have a lot to sell. And uh, I just thought I'd go over all that. Um, we're probably you know, counting everything. I mean, even with salaries, I used to say with county health insurance, we had the best package. We have the best package. Counting salaries in North Florida, more than none. It's, uh, it's, except for, excuse me, Gilchrist County and Lafayette. But, you know, they're not as big as Buell. But um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. Thank, I just, you know, I had that stuff today. I've been working on it. And it just gave me a chance to, to brag about it. I never thought we'd be up to 21st in the state. I thought we'd be in the 30s, but not 21st. Maybe we went too high. Oh, God, I, that was a stupid statement. I might not live for that, past that one. But we, we, we do have a great working uh, conditions. I'm glad to see the paras are still, you guys are, you guys are, te you guys are, are tutoring them and, and teaching them. The paras, we give them the study guides, and so we don't really offer them the tutoring, but they have the study guides for the para. And usually they team up with somebody else. Yeah. Well, I used to teach it with Bev Jones. Yes. I taught the math, thinking math, they used to call it. And uh, we got it from AFT. And uh, because they, when it came out, that all oh, the parents had to get highly qualified real quick to lose their jobs. Right. And uh, I, it was 180 to be exact the first year we did it. We used to do it over in the ACA office and had a meeting room there. We teach it. So. Uh, Anyway, we do a lot of good things. You got Dr. McNeely's program at GHS. If you don't mind me mentioning that again, do you? Oh, we, we love uh, Grow Your Heart. Right, so a lot of good things going here. You guys are doing a good job. I just, I just it's something I had worked on all day today. And here you go up there. And if, if you get the uh, fund balance and the other and the staffing reports in the mail, at, Paper. I'll be a happy guy. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I just want to say that our team is just, they're incredible. I mean, they're just relentless workers. Our principals, site supervisors that go out and they recruit in Publix and wherever. So everybody's doing their piece. It's not any one person. So we're excited about it. We need to get a, 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 how we're doing is recruiting minorities too. That's one of the things in our, in our strategic plan. Yes, sir. I remember it, it, sometimes it gets lost in the shuffle, but we need that. And not you, it got lost in the shuffle in the past. No, it's a focus. It's yeah, I mean, but it, well, we, need a, we need a report. You know, we get a report and see how it's going. Yeah, that's what we used to have a recruit. That was ready for the equity update that was in December that had been canceled. We had had that all in there. Yes, sir. That's okay. Mr. Purvis, um, you're, you have a great team, and we appreciate everything that um, you are leading your team's effort. Um, one of the things that I always do, and I don't know if you have it somewhere in your packet, but anytime that I run into someone who used to be a part of Alachua County school system, yes, and they have been out for at least a year, mm -hmm. I don't let them get by me. I will ask, I beg today, uh, a, a someone who came by and begged her, and I'm not gonna let up on her. And um, there are a lot of other folk that have been home long enough now. <laughs> and um, I'm always calling, asking, and they hate to see me out in public because they know what I'm going to say. I think we need to concentrate on some of those um, folk. and. Um, Retired you, you would be surprised. Madam Chair, retired educators, some of them, you have meetings, that's what I'm talking about. I'll that, with, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So that's all I and have. And we do reach out to them, Doc. We okay. do reach out to retirees. I've reached out to some. Um, they never respond to my text or calls. Uh, and I don't take that personal. Uh, um, but that's okay. Because um, when I do talk to some of them, they're like, you must be crazy. But, you know, we try to talk them in and whatever we can get them in any capacity is what we try to get them into. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. And now, Dr. Simon, COVID response team. Yeah. So um, actually, I'm going to have my COVID response crew, uh, team crew, they're going to present. 
And so Prescott Coles and Jason Stanford will be discussing what we have been doing uh, with the COVID response team. And then we're gonna have Jenny Weiss uh, present the educational component of the COVID response spring semester. So Mr. we've got a lot to talk about. Prescott, before you even begin, I, I, I have to say this publicly. Um, what you were able to handle last Friday and Mrs. Johnson being at the site as well, but I know I must have called you at least six or seven <laughs> times. And I know I had um, citizens calling you and you never, never got upset. It must be something in your genes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah, come on up. All right, so um, the COVID-19 response team, uh, which has been recently, very recently formed, um, is uh, the two of us. Um, so what I want to do is kind of break down the highlights of what We've started in the past 11 days, um, and where we're gonna go from here. So why we were established as a purpose um, from the superintendent, kind of our relevant experience and background, um, how we hope to apply it, um, what we've been able to do so far, projects we have uh, in progress, and some that we have um, upcoming. So the point of this COVID response team is we've, we've had a scientific medical advisory committee that's been helping us uh, since August. Then in October, we got uh, an epidemic pandemic response team, which is a, a large group, uh, 30, 40 people to share their ideas. Um, what we're here to do is to uh, be direct efforts uh, and to meet all these needs that have uh, come up throughout the year. Um, so to assess, to build, and to sustain the preparedness and response to COVID-19 for students, teachers, and staff um, in our schools. So the way that that's really gonna happen is this is how it kind of broke it down. We've got to reflect, which means we've been in this pandemic for a year, literally last January. We've been in, in this school year uh, for about six months. So we've gone through this experience and we can learn from it to make that experience better going forward. And that's what responding is. It's taking action based on what we've seen, but also what the experience has been on the ground. Reinforcing, that means we've set up policies that we need to make sure are upheld, but also reinforcing our students, and our staff, giving them the support they need to be successful. And the goal of that would be to get to recovery. So eventually we'll be past COVID-19 um, but that's going to take a lot of work. Um, so the two of us, we are, while we're dividing our responsibilities, uh, Mr. Stanford with um, program evaluation and accountability, and uh, myself with communication, community engagement, we're, we're really a collaborative um, effort between us and um, within the district as well. So I'm going to let Mr. Stanford give a little bit of his experience and how he hopes to make it happen. Sure, thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. McNeely and other members of the board. Um, as of uh, now, I've been on the, on the job about eight hours. <laughs> um, but many of you know me. Um, I'm a former teacher at Hawthorne High School. I'm also a Lotsworth County native and was educated in Lotsworth County at Hawthorne High School. Um, some of my background, just to give you, uh, for those that don't know me, brief uh, introduction of my professional experience. Um, when I moved home in 2016 to be near my family, I had left a career in uh, public service, uh, primarily in the federal government. I worked um, at the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, I was originally hired as a grants management specialist and program advisor, working on uh, projects of uh, public health emergency preparedness, dealing with state and local governments, helping them develop their preparedness plans for all hazard responses. Originally, this program was designed in after 2011 or 2001, 9/11, um, and we were. This program was designed to prepare to respond for communities from all hazards attacks, including terrorism, uh, biological attacks, or pandemics, which is what we're in now. 
while I was at the CDC during serving in that time, I worked during the Ebola years, and so I was moved to the Ebola response team where I was charged with setting up quarantine stations at U.S. airports, uh, amongst other things, division, working with division of state and local readiness. Um, I also served as a grants management specialist at that time, reviewing grant proposals and writing grant RFPs uh, to make sure that uh, when those states and local governments returned their grants to us, I reviewed them to make sure that they were legal and make sure that they were actually doing what we were paying them to do. Before that, I was also at Health and Human Services, which is the the mother agency of CDC, and I worked there in Washington, D.C., as also as a grants management specialist, public health analyst, and as a program advisor to grants.gov, helping states and local governments apply for funding during emergencies. Um, and then I also have a background in state employment. When I was a young man and graduated from here from Alachua County, I moved on to get a big boy job and worked at state government in uh, way back in the early 2000s. Um, and helped uh, county health departments and any other local jurisdictions deal with HIV prevention. So um, to fast forward, um, I think that what I bring to the table is one, first and foremost, my love of children in Alachua County. I'm proud to be educated from here. And as Mr. Purvis said, we do a good job. I've worked with some of the best teachers that I've ever seen in this county. Uh, what I, that passion and my desire to prevent COVID infection as much as we can, along with my work experience, I hope to be able to provide you with as much information as you all need to feel comfortable about decisions you make. But I also hope to provide teachers, bus drivers, custodians, and others that are put themselves at risk every day. I hope to provide them with some reassurance that I am there for them. I was not hired to be a gotcha person and I'm not hired to try to find fault with people. I'm, I'm gonna be looking for ways that we're excelling and doing things well, and let's replicate those as best practices and then find vulnerabilities uh, where we, will, we could be vulnerable to COVID and how we can change that, how we can improve it. Um, I have a couple other slides that I'll talk about, specifically my job duties in a second, but to let uh, my supervisor Prescott, uh, he'll tell you what he does. Huh. <clears throat> supervisor today. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I'm also from here in Alachua County. I'm through, uh, went through our schools, went, graduated from Eastside High School with the IB program um, a little bit more recently. Um, in 2017, I got my education degree, um, secondary science education um, from the University of South Florida through the, the Helio STEM residency program um, with a concentration in middle grade science. Uh, from them, I, I went into teaching science in Hillsborough County um, at Franklin Boys Preparatory Academy, where I taught for two years. Um, science, as well as the course, re course recovery program um, for students um, who needed to make up courses the following semester, we extended the opportunity, um, as well as being a head track and field coach. Um, through Alachua County Public Schools, I've actually been employed um, since graduating high school uh, through Camp Crystal Lake. Um, every summer working my way from a, a camp counselor to the program director, kind of overseeing the day-to-day -day operations, um, moving on to a, a full-time position as a registrar and camper specialist, um, where primarily I was the, the main point of contact for parents, for organizations, for schools um, during their field trips, um, as well as uh, developing our systems for registration, um, for our scholarship programs, and seeing how we can um, streamline those as well. Um, most recently, um, due to COVID, uh, when we had to close um, Camp Crystal for the summer, I then got to see a lot of the other parts of our district, uh, including the Office of Student Assignment, which is zoning, Lake Forest Elementary, Alachua East School, uh, and the Volunteer Business Partnership Office, uh, through which I had projects at uh, Metcalf, Norton, Shell, Buholtz, um, all within a very short period of time. So I've got to see um, not only how our schools work and how it's been going this semester, um, but kind of have the educational training and the ability to communicate the, the science um, behind these viruses and how we can uh, actually respond to them. So some of the things that we've gotten a handle on in the past uh, 11 days that I've been here, I'm gonna report on what's been done, um, what's about to happen, and then what we hope to accomplish. So most uh, recently, we have the updated COVID case dashboard, which is on our website right now. 
Um, the goal of this was to provide more transparent data for families and for staff, uh, but also in a way that's meaningful and interactive. Um, so you can go back for each specific school or site, look back at the cases throughout the year, see how the trends have changed, um, as well as additional information about um, how students are choosing to learn in person or virtually, uh, and, and we hope to add more and more to that so it can be a tool to understand uh, a pulse of how we're doing this year. Um, we have developed and will be sending uh, tomorrow uh, a semester two planning survey for teachers and staff. The goal of this is to understand how the experience is from those who are living it. Because as much as we have seen, uh, we have not been in every single person's shoes. And in order for us to improve, we've got to learn uh, from the professionals who have been doing it and have a lot to offer. So um, I know that we've had tons of surveys in the past that staff can look at, and it's just another thing to do on the to-do list. Uh, but I promise that this is going to be what directs how we do our work for the next uh, six months until we get through this. You know, we're going to take that input to direct our actions. Um, recently, uh, we, the superintendent has asked for additional guidance from our scientific medical advisory committee. This is the, the group of physicians, the group of uh, public health experts, uh, pediatricians to ask uh, their evaluation about how we've been doing, any changes that we need to uh, take going forward. So in case you didn't have the opportunity, um, they did share this during our pandemic response team meeting last week. Um, but I thought it was valuable to um, at least share their message um, to a wider audience today. Um, so this, this is from that group. It says, we have reviewed our mitigation metrics for school and classroom closure. And despite rising numbers in community cases, we do not recommend any modification at this time. The, match, the metrics for closure document is built on school-based transmission and infection. We know that community spread can and may have an impact on schools but we had minimal in-school transmission this fall in elementary and middle schools and only some in the high schools related to sports and non-school activities. We are continuing our testing and contact tracing, monitoring both community dynamics and the numbers in the schools very carefully. We will take action following the original in-school metrics or make adjustments to the metrics if we feel there are significant changes in the dynamics of school-based transmission. Currently, our local numbers of hospitalized patients are on the rise but ICU cases are down and our hospitals are quite full, but not your crisis care. We understand that there are multiple parameters occurring at the same time. Rising community cases, more students returning to face-to-face -face learning, indoor sports, as well as ongoing immunization efforts. In addition, we are monitoring the possibility of new virus variants in our school age population. We will monitor closely and provide updates to our recommendations as needed. Uh, this is the group that I've, I've wanted to hear more from, and I think that they have really made a concerted effort to um, be the advisors that w we need. Um, so I, one of my goals is to help them deliver their message uh, to our school community. One of the things uh, specifically that the superintendent asked for was uh, recommendations on our winter and sport, uh, spring uh, athletic events. Um, there were concerns about um, you know, the guidance about COVID-19 is not gathering in crowded spaces uh, in close contact. And unfortunately, now it's happening um, fairly often for our, these large athletic events. Um, so they did develop a set of, of recommendations. Um, and these were then reviewed and kind of established the policy by every athletic director um, at the high school level and every principal um, all got together and kind of figured out how can these recommendations actually be put uh, into practice? Um, so after th these recommendations were made and that collaboration um, happened, this is where we are in terms of our protocols going now, uh, going forward, but these are uh, subject to change, like they said, as they monitor everything that's going on. Um, so these policies, I'll go ahead and read them off. It says, uh, each school hosting an event is responsible for implementing the school's district's masking and social distancing policies. If these cannot be enforced, 
then the event should be canceled or stopped if already underway. Again, we have these policies in place. This is uh, the reinforcement of these policies. Uh, masks or face coverings are mandatory for all spectators, coaches, referees, and athletes on the sidelines, and participating athletes should wear masks if feasible. Social distancing of six feet should be adhered to within the facility. Families may be seated together and then separated from other families. To maintain so social distancing guidelines, attendance at each event will be limited to 15% capacity. Uh, this is a reduction uh, from the previous 25%. Uh, all tickets will be pre-sold electronically to ensure this limit is maintained. When necessary, schools may consider athlete-only events. Schools should consider alternative platforms for its spectator participation in events, such as live stream video events for matches and meets, and other creative alternative approaches may be possible. If a team fails to comply with these guidelines or has an outbreak of COVID-19 within the team, resulting directly from team activities, uh, this team season may be discontinued. So we've seen at the professional level and the college level, they're able to play with no fans and they're just all right. Um, you know, we, we've got to prioritize the health and safety of our athletes um, and keeping our schools open. And to do that, we've got to increase um, some of the measures that we're already taking. So this is a part of that. Um, as Dr. McNeely mentioned, one of the things I'm, I'm most excited that we've been able to do so far uh, is our vaccine clinic for our staff and retirees uh, 65 and over. So this just happened last Friday. We found out there was an opportunity on Wednesday. Um, so with a very quick turnaround time, we got uh, 90 of our uh, 65 and over staff vaccinated, which was uh, almost half of that group uh, vaccinated in one day. Um, and an additional 110 uh, retirees who were able to fill in those extra spots that we had available. Uh, this was an event that was co-hosted by UF Health and the Elijah County Health Department. Um, it's actually the first time that they had a drive-through clinic like this, um, and it's gonna be the model that they're using going forward for the rest of the community. Um, so as we have future events and as um, other um, organizations get their uh, staff vaccinated, as our entire community you know, gets vaccinated, they're gonna be using this model that we started with them. Um, this was limited to 65 and over, um, because of Governor DeSantis' executive order, you know, as, as much as we'd like to have this available um, for all of our staff and as much as we are being gracious but very, uh, um, maybe a little bit pestering, you know, how can we get this for all of our staff? Um, you know, we're happy that we were able to pull this off. Um, and this was a really quick turnaround time, so there was definitely some uh, bumps in the process. Um, but we've learned lessons about how to make it run a little bit more smoothly. Um, so works in progress is the next vaccine clinics are already happening and they're gonna be scheduled for this week um, on Wednesday and on Thursday from two to 5 p.m. Um, there's another 150 appointments available each day. So by the end of this week, another 300 um, ACPS staff and employees um, will have the opportunity to get uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, this registration is open. I, I know that the spots fill in up pretty quickly, um, but we also created an opportunity uh, for a morning clinic available for our transportation staff uh, because the afternoon time can be challenging uh, with their bus schedules. Um, so we created this additional opportunity um, for those people to go um, and be able to get that vaccine as well. So that's happening uh, this week, and this is hopefully the model that we can use going forward. Um, a few other things that we've got um, going forward, processes that are happening a little bit behind the scenes, um, reviewing and revising the key documents uh, for policies for clarity. So there's a lot of um, guidance that we want to make sure is actually usable. Um, we're developing the COVID website to be more functional resource um, and communicating the best practices that are already in place. Um, so a lot of this week has been uh, me trying to, you know, touch base with different departments, different school leaders, and there's a lot of things that are actually working, and we want to get the word out to, you know, reassure our staff, our families that, 
these are the great things that we actually have going on. So then we can focus on, all right, these are the things that we need to fix. Another uh, project that we hope to finalize soon is the, our teacher advisory committee. Uh, so, so the goal of this is to foster honest discussion of the challenges, issues, questions, and successes of the school district uh, during the pandemic because there's a lot of challenges, issues, questions, and successes, um, but also beyond. Um, so the policy, we've been drafting it, um, and once it gets finalized and uh, further developed with the ACEA, it will be able to be presented uh, to you for approval. Um, and another avenue we've been trying to correct uh, and improve is our internal coordination. Uh, specifically today, we were able to have a pretty productive meeting um, about some of the communications uh, breakdowns on our case information. Um, specifically, there's pretty significant differences uh, between the Department of Health's case tracking systems and our internal case tracking systems. Um, thankfully, we, we've been able to have a, a meeting of the minds. Um, and the goal would be to uh, increase response times or improve response times so we're able to, uh, you know, to <coughs> stop these uh, infections as they happen, respond more quickly um, to prevent further spread, and also ensuring oversight to make sure that you know, as these cases are reported, there's somebody looking out to make sure uh, the process uh, is taken care of and things don't fall through the cracks. Um, part of that is also streamlining part of the work that's been put on our principals. Um, you know, they've been doing a lot of extra work um, during this pandemic, so figuring out what parts, uh, what, which responsibilities we can take from them to help them out. Um, also, some of the internal coordination, again, some very recent developments, um, is uh, some KN95 masks. Um, so these are um, the masks which have 95% uh, filtration. Um, we've had a lot in storage and we've made a pretty concerted effort to get them out uh, to staff that have been asking for them. Kind of repairing some miscommunication, um, but getting that issue uh, addressed moving forward. Um, so I'm going to talk about some of the roles that what you're, uh, I'm going to be doing in my new job, uh, but this is what to expect next. Um, and uh, you'll notice that um, Mr. Coles has done an excellent job the last 11 days, and I'm saying that from a former project officer at the CDC. I would give this man a, a commendation. He, uh, 11 days, folks, <laughs> and two of these slides are mine. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm very impressed and I'm very happy to be working on this team. So some of the things that I'm going to do in my role, one of the main things that I'll be doing is I'll be going to conduct site visits on school campuses and Alachua County school facilities. I'm not going to be reserving this to just campuses. Um, COVID spreads everywhere. Um, I will make sure that um, we are addressing policies that are already in place. I will not be surprising anybody that works for the Alachua County school system. One of the first things that I'm working on right now is, and I'm gonna go, excuse me, I'll go into that next, but I'm drafting guidance to give to principals and assistant principals and then directors within the school system that direct some kind of property off of this property. Um, I'll provide that guidance to those folks before a site visit is conducted so that they have an idea of what they should be prepared for. Um, in that site visit, I'm going to use my experience from the CDC. There are 15 standard, uh, national standards that are called 15 capabilities for a community or a local jurisdiction to prepare to respond to an event. I'm not going to use all of them because they, so many of them don't apply here, but the ones that do, I'm listed, I've listed here. And I'll just be very brief, and uh, Mr. Coles has mentioned some of these already. Um, for community preparedness, I'm going to be uh, looking at what are we doing as a school system to prepare our campuses specifically. So community in this case means campuses or property that we own. Um, I'm going and for lack of a better way to say this, the best math equation I ever learned in Alachua County was an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And it stands true today. Community preparedness is prevention. Do our kids, our young people know how to prevent COVID and the spread of other diseases? It's documented that grown boys don't always wash their hands after they leave the bathroom before COVID. Washing your hands is a very effective method of preventing illness. Are we doing that? Are we teaching young people to do that effectively? And are we promoting that? 
Also, are we wearing masks? Are we social distancing? Do we know what the risks are? Do we know if there's a, a at-risk student who may have a health, uh, chronic health issue? Have we addressed that? Or do we know how to help that student or that parent? As far as non-medical and social interventions, those are masks, hand washing or, or uh, you know, uh, hand sanitizer, but it's also social distancing and are we adhering to that? So anything that's not a shot or a pill, are we preventing disease in that way and is it easy to do? Are we, where are we succeeding? PPE supplies management and distribution. We have masks, we have sanitizer, we have all kinds of things at our disposal, we have CARE Act money that we were, we're gonna use to spend with that. Are we actually getting it to the people that need it? And are we doing a good job of that? And where are we working well with that? Are we not doing a good job of that? And how could we do better? Because masks sitting on a shelf don't prevent COVID. And I know we all know this. So we need to make sure what are we doing well there? How are we getting it to the people that actually need it? Staff safety and health. Again, we're not a, we're not a hospital system and we have some of the best in the country. But what, we're gonna, what I'm gonna be looking at here is do the teachers and the custodians and bus drivers feel safe with what we put in place? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, I need to know what they think would make it better so that they're, they feel safe. But also, we're a year into this, and you know, some of us teachers have had COVID before. It's tough, you know? We all know that these people suffer. Do, what are we doing to help these people return to school? You know, are we making sure that they're in their care? And, and how, what is our role? As far as testing goes, we're doing a great job in the sense that we're making, if people need to get tested and they want, if they're an employee of this school system, then what can we do to help them get tested? If they show up to school on a, on a Tuesday morning saying, you know, boss, I'm not feeling great and I really need to get tested, do they get sent home or do we have a test there? And, and does every school that way? That leads us into surveillance and case tracking. Uh, Mr. Coles has talked about that a little bit already. I won't go into it, but I wanna know where we're doing well. Or, and if there is a case if in a school of a, a middle schooler and she or he has been expo exposed to other students, how are we tracking that case? And, and we all know this, we have a policy in place, but are we doing a good job? And it, is everybody that's supposed to be doing that doing a good job? And where can we help those that are maybe struggling? Information sharing and public alerts, Mr. Coles has done, and, and his people before me have done an excellent job with this, uh, uh, with this site, with this uh, dashboard and et cetera. But are we, are we making it real? Are we telling the truth? Um, and there, we need to provide our campuses and other people that work for this system opportunities to make sure that they are sharing the right information and not oversharing. And how can we help them with that? And what does that look like to make you all, help you all do your job better in the community? Vaccine administration, again, I cannot, I mean, I, I, I challenge any medical professional in this community to criticize what this man did in 36 hours, 24 hours. It is amazing that we got that many people vaccinated. They want to do it again. Let's make it happen. Let's encourage our people to get vaccinated. Lastly, and, and how can we do that? You know, how can, how can we help campuses or other people that need to get a vaccine? And one of the things that I was going to look at immediately, and Mr. Coles has already addressed is that bus drivers drive our kids home in the afternoon so they're not going to have time to get over here so we need to accommodate them we need to make sure that we're thinking about who we are trying to serve and are we meeting them where they are and then the last is volunteer management and this is one that is a personal issue for me and i'm going to look at see what we can do but we need our volunteers in these schools i relied on a lot of my volunteers when i was teaching and, but are, we, are they the right people for our school? And do we have a policy that keeps them protected? And are they able to be in there? Or do we, how are we dealing with that, right? So the next thing is administrative and financial response. I'll be honest, this is not part of the capabilities. These are where my grants management specialist or, uh, history comes in. And it has to do with resource acquisition. We got CARES Act money, we got all this other stuff that we, applied, we acquired these resources, did, now are we using them? And how did, are we telling the people that gave us the money, are we telling the people that gave us the supplies, did we use them right? Resource distribution, are we giving, are we doling this out in a way that everybody is getting the resources equitably? Does everybody have what they need 
Does somebody have more than they need and they're just sitting on a shelf? And can we give that to a place where they're, they're struggling? Um, we need to make sure that we distribute it properly and that there's a plan to do that. Monitoring and risk management is, for those that don't know, we just need to make sure that folks are doing what they said they're doing with the resources that we have because we don't know how long it'll be. They may be finite, but we need to make sure. And we also need to look at risk management. Um, there may, who knows where masks or, or sanitizer are stored, but there may be an opportunity for someone to just walk in and grab what they need when they need it and not tell anyone. And then suddenly you're 15 masks short and you don't know where they went. So we just need to make sure that we get everything that we need out and that everybody can track it. Lastly is policy development and implementation, and that is just basically what Mr. Coles was mentioning earlier. Let's get the policies that are working, let's get them out there, make sure everybody knows it. But if we need to, to fix something or tighten something up, then how can we do that and move it forward? And does, is it realistic for every campus? Every campus may not be the same. So how do we implement that policy fairly, equitably, but at the same time, we're uplifting the folks that are doing the hard work every day. The last thing I'll say, and this is the end of my slide, but I wanna make sure that I'm on record as this because I am a former teacher of this, this district and I'm proud of that. It was the hardest job I've ever had in my life, but I love it. I am a fan of teachers. I am a fan of the bus drivers that get my kids to my class every day and I'm a fan of the custodians who keep my room clean when the dirty middle schoolers leave. <laughs> I'm going to help these people. I'm not going to get anybody in a gotcha moment. I want to reinforce the fact that there are things that some of our schools are knocking it out of the park with. And I want to find out what they're doing good so we can put it in the other schools, best practices. And where we have vulnerabilities, I want us to figure out how we shore that up and to ensure that those people don't feel left out. because. We are all tired, it's a year in, and you all have been doing a great job, this other staff have been doing a great job, teachers, custodians, and bus drivers have been kicking it. We need to, to work for them, and that is the only reason that I accepted this role. How can I help with the skills that I got to show the teachers and the custodians and the people who are doing the day-to-day -day that we care for them? And I don't think there's any denying that, but how can we do this better? I'm there to help them. I'm not there to look for anything bad. I want to help us get this, get through this. It's an honor to work for this group, and it's an honor to work for Mr. Cole. Thank you. A couple uh, last few pieces that we want you to expect, and I, I know this is a bit of a long presentation, but it's the last time you had a, a COVID update. I kind of tell you when. Uh, so we want to be able to share information. So as we are going on these. Uh, site visits as we're getting information from our teacher and staff survey. Um, we want to be able to give that one to you as a decision-making body. Um, you want to be justified in your decisions, uh, but also to our, our community so they can use that in their own lives. Um, the dashboard is going to be one of the tools where we do that. Um, and also to build some reassurance that these accounta accountability measures um, are being taken care of. And all throughout this experience, what we're going to be using to guide us is the feedback we receive. Um, part of that that we haven't really heard too much yet is from the students themselves. Uh, so we'll be developing opportunities for the people in the classrooms to explain their experience um, and how they think it'd be improved. And strategic planning for this pandemic response team. We've got a great group of, of 40 people dedicating their time to this. Uh, let's make sure that um, we're helping them use their time to make this all more effective. Um, and lastly, some partnerships and support that we're continuing to build. Um, we're exploring partnerships to strengthen uh, our contact tracing efforts. Um, this is one of the biggest challenges that our school staff have had to pick on, uh, pick up. Um, and we're also scaling up our vaccine uh, distribution with UF Health and Department of Health. Um, so hopefully as soon as we can, uh, we'll be able to be prepared uh, to distribute that um, to all of our employees. We've asked uh, and we've been kindly told not yet, um, but we're keeping on pushing. Um, and so that's kind of where we're going. You know, we're reflecting, we're looking at the experience that's uh, been on the ground so far. We're going to respond. We know that we're jumping in in the middle of this, but we're going to do what we can and we're going to reinforce our goals to support 
what's already been going on. Everyone has been putting a lot of work uh, and we're here to help them with that. And hopefully uh, we can make things a little better and get a little bit of recovery along the way. So, happy to field any questions. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, sure we talked about um, Mr. Hyatt, then um, Dr. Paulson, Mrs. McGraw, uh, and then we'll go on from there. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, long board presentations, but this was worth every single minute. It was absolutely vital. Uh, it, it lets us know what we need to know. It, it, and, and as I, I think I wrote a, a very short, not a long, but a short email to Mr. Coles, and saying what he was doing was literally saving lives. And, and so uh, this is, um, I, you know, I, I think is uh, so vitally important. And it, it's, it, it's always about what we can do to move, to, to get better, to be safer, uh, and, and literally to save lives and, and people's health. Um, I, I, Dr. McNeely already jumped in. I was going to say this during my uh, board member announcements, but I, I, I will not have any announcements now. I, I did want to say uh, how impressed I was with um, certainly uh, everybody that, that helped with the vaccinations. Uh, uh, Dr. Simon getting that happening, uh, uh, Mr. Coles, uh, Ms. Johnson, uh, and and uh, certainly just for communication, uh, Ms. Peck, Ms. Wetley, everybody uh, just going on full blast on, on a very, very short time frame. And that's uh, remarkable. Uh, I, I, so I, I want to say I'm very excited about this. Uh, and um, it, anything I can do to, to support your cause, I, I think that would be true for everybody here. Uh, and it's so nice. Uh, I, I, you know, I've known I, I Mr. Stanford for a few years, and he's one of the most impressive people that I've ever had the pleasure to, to work with or work next to. And, and uh, I know the two of you will be a great team. Uh, my only tiny little thing is, when, Mr. Coles last week, yeah, when we were here um, on the Wednesday special meeting, you were over there working a million miles an hour, and I wasn't aware of your new position. And, and so it's not, I, I sort of figured it out. Uh, also, I, I, I got the very good news that Mr. Safford was going to accept this job uh, from a friend who saw it on Facebook and called me. So, so uh, it, when, when we have these things, uh, I, I think board members need to know in advance, but um, I, I'd say that I don't think Dr. Simon could have possibly gotten two better people. I, and and uh, I think that this is going to pay, again, it all gets back to children, that this is gonna pay uh, dividends for our employees, and uh, I'm just so happy to have you both on board. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Hyatt. Dr. Paulson and then Mrs. McGraw. Oh, well, ditto, it's a very good presentation. Thank you. Um, the other one is, um, I, I got the shot too. It went well, it went very smoothly. And, uh, and somebody was there, so thank you for that. And I, I just want to say that. Last, um, so I don't want to make this too long. Right now, I, I look at the county's dashboard like today, it was 3.64% positivity and 6.6%. They've done pretty good in this county. I mean, they compared to the state. Um, in terms of the both the level of spread and the amount of testing, I'd say Alachua County's been one of the best in the state. Yeah, you didn't expect that. You know, when back in September, you were thinking, oh, university town had a little Right after Thanksgiving, had a little jump, but I didn't—it's not getting the jump after Christmas we were expecting. 
Um, I, I know that the cases have increased after the winter break. Um, Maybe gone down the last two weeks, though? I think it's not enough, and this is part of what the, the medical advisory committee was mm -hmm. um, saying is, you know, we know it's going up, but they also are, are very, very closely looking at each and every case. I was uh, kind of surprised to hear them go into the detail um, during our pandemic response team meeting about how they responded to each case, doing different uh, genetic analysis for different specific infections. Um, so we've, that's what we've got going on that a lot of other people don't, is we've got a team of doctors with a, a very close eye on what's going on. I, I mean, I was stunned when I saw 6.6 because .6 it was up to 10 for a couple of weeks, mm -hmm. for the two weeks. Um, so anyway, you know, I'm going to look into you. I haven't looked at your dashboard. I'm going to look at it. Do you have the positivity? It's not like even similar to them. So, so we don't have a positivity rate on our dashboard um, because we don't have all of the tests um, that are taken because some students yeah. get tested you know, at okay. CVS, some get tested at our school. So what ours just shows uh, the numbers of students and staff. Okay. And the last thing, I see a high school principal here. It's, uh, you guys kept your uh, people that could go to the games the way down. What was it 1,000 people at Citizens Bureau? Yes, sir. I got a lot of that. Well, I'm, well I, yeah, I'm talking about you kept people, you kept the attendance down. You do the best you can. And I thought that was, and, and, and I, you guys played a full season. So, uh, again, I'm, I'm, I don't want to waste your time. You guys made a good presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mrs. McGraw? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, outstanding. You know, I had an opportunity to speak with both of these gentlemen uh, as community people before you even got involved. And so, to, it's so refreshing um, to see people who really just, you, you hit the ground running with it, you know, even before you were hired. And so, I really appreciate that. And I thank uh, um, Dr. Simon for you all coming and getting involved and making sure this is happening because I'm telling you, people are out there talking. People were so excited when I shared the dashboard on Facebook to see the more we effectively communicate, the better you will be and the less issues we will have. So I'm so excited, even at one of the basketball games I was at this weekend or uh, this past week or whenever, your principal and your assistant principal were announcing throughout uh, the game, you must have on your mask, or uh, there was one person who, a couple of people who didn't, they were asked to leave. And so that's important. And so I just want to thank you all. It was, a, it, was, it was a long presentation, but it was necessary. I enjoyed it. And so thank you for your hard work. And um, anything we can do to help, we're here. Thank you again, Madam Chair. Uh -huh. All right. Uh, um, Dr. Simon, I want to thank you as well. Um, tomorrow at 12 o'clock, 12.01, we'll have a new president. And he is looking to grab people um, for his COVID team. And um, I would hope that he would not reach down to Alachua County and take these gentlemen. <laughs> but I can tell you one thing, guys, 65 and older, people, you know, kind of shy away from telling their age. When this report came out and they could do it, it was amazing how many people didn't mind saying how old they were. So uh, again, thank you to both of you and we look forward to great things continuing. That's scary, I'm the oldest one in the room. <laughs> Good evening. Hello. Thank you, Madam Chair, Board Members, Superintendent. I am here to give you a brief update on the spring plan. So the last time we talked, I was here with the draft that was actually due the day we talked about it. Um, Emergency Order 202007 authorized us to continue the Digital Academy, provide con financial continuity, extended the deadline for our teachers who provide Tier 3 reading intervention to get that endorsement or certification by June 30th of 21 instead of December 31st, and it required us to have 
a spring 2021 education plan approved, which ours was over the break on the 29th. In our spring plan, we have four areas that we must address as we support all of our students, but especially those in the Digital Academy. That first area is to really focus on the intervention plan, focus on closing those achievement gaps by offering extended learning opportunities, increasing the level or intensity of the intervention for students who aren't making adequate progress. And our plan includes additional paraprofessional support in all of our elementary schools. It provides for COVID recovery tutoring for our ESE students. It provides after school or Saturday tutoring and credit recovery in all of our secondary schools. It provides for ELA math and science boot camps in all of our elementary schools. It asks us to be sure that we're having data chats with students and involving them and their families in problem solving and goal setting. And it provides for us honing the use of our digital resources, such as Khan Academy. Mrs. Freeman's doing a lot of work with our schools around this, um, and Brain Pop, ELL, Rosetta Stone, just to name a few. The second area is really about the notification that we're required to provide all of our families whose students are not making adequate progress. And those students are to be identified as any whose attendance falls below 90% if they have failing grades or a loss of credit or performing below expectations on our district progress monitoring. So for all of those students, we will be providing written notice and what area they are not being successful with or needing extra support and in return, we'll be asking for written acknowledgement about whether or not they intend to remain in the Digital Academy or return to brick and mortar. We are very mindful of being sure that we support parent choice of learning modalities and continue to engage in problem solving around interventions and support for our students to improve their academic performance no matter which option they're in. The third area is around truancy and attendance. And this is asking us to really ramp up our efforts to engage the students who've had limited or no contact with the district and work to transition them to the appropriate learning modality. But it also asks us to really work hard to identify those VPK and kindergarten eligible students to engage those families and ensure readiness for school. To that end, the schools have been allocated additional clerical hours to be used for, to assist the schools with parent contact and documentation of the communication and interventions. Each school will be establishing their own truancy team and working to enhance their school-based incentive programs for improving attendance. We will also be working with schools on their outreach and engagement with families who've had limited or no contact with the schools. The fourth and final area that we addressed in our spring plan is important that we continue to provide professional development to our teachers and leaders around in innovative and virtual learning, interventions and supports targeted to those students who need them most and responding to technology needs. So we are continuing to offer on-demand synchronous and asynchronous learning opportunities through a robust micro PD calendar. We're releasing weekly PD in three videos, are very popular with quick kind of grab and go things for our teachers. The topics that we're including at this time are data informed decision making so that we're sure we're identifying the students and what their needs are, differentiated instruction, culturally responsive pedagogy, social emotional learning, engagement strategies, best practices in distance learning, and continuing to offer support around Canvas and Zoom. 
So as we've rolled out the plan, it's been a quick timeline to turn this around. All of the principals have been oriented to the plan. The additional allocations are available to the schools to advertise for hire or to assign to those who volunteer or have time in their daily schedules for additional hours. District staff are supporting the school-based planning for the spring interventions around both those academic supports and the truancy supports. District staff members are providing coverage in the schools so that you can release the school truancy teams and administrators to make home visits during the school day to try to engage parents in the problem solving around better meeting their students' needs. Um, the parent notification letters that we're required to send home will be uh, worth to begin being distributed today and through this week. And those intensified interventions and supports will begin February 1st with the new semester. Another important uh, shift that we're making in our digital academy is part of our digital academy norms. We've been working with the student services office in sort of laying out an increased effort to ensure that students are using their cameras when they're in class in the digital academy in an effort to increase engagement, build community, and optimize learning. So we're gonna really focus on asking students to have their cameras on when they're asked by their teachers during the second semester. We know how important, especially old school teachers like myself, that eye contact and body language is to help inform teachers about student learning and how important it is in them building relationships with their peers. So the students should have their cameras on during the teacher designated class times and they are free to use green screens or virtual backgrounds. We're also asking that just like the students in brick and mortar, that our digital academy students respond verbally or in writing or through whatever identified communication means their teachers have asked for as they would in the traditional classroom setting. There is the option for our students with documented issues that prevent them from accessing the class with the camera on a form that families could complete for an exemption to this new um, enhanced expectation. With that, I'll take any questions you might have about our uh, spring plan that begins very soon. Dr. Paulson. Yeah, I, you know, I back three, four months ago, I went and spent two, two hour sessions with Uma. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean now what, it, what have you done to enhance this? What, what, the cameras are on. What cameras are going to be on? The cameras on their computers, so when right. they're at home, so that the cameras, so that the teachers can see the students. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. On their laptops or whatever device, handheld device, whatever they're using. Now let me, I'm going to go again brag on you guys, because remember the University of Florida came to us. I do for help because, and I remember when, Uma, when I went out there and did that, and he, he had a, they had a, um, a, a showing a teacher at the University of Florida teaching, and it was so much behind what we did here, it was amazing. I bet they catch up really fast though. Huh? <laughs> well, that's why they called you guys. Maybe. I just thought I'd brag about that. I, I thought that was amazing. So, uh, I'd like you to know too that the touch screen monitors um, mm -hmm. are being installed and being used. I know when we walked to classrooms last week or this week, Mrs. Certain, we saw those uh, being used. And that's a big help for teachers who are doing high flex, the, the second touch screen monitor. Yeah, I guess so the, those the are thing high flex being rolled is out as well. If the kid's at home and he doesn't have the, it doesn't, isn't self motivated and he doesn't have parents that are remote, there to motivate him. Well, that's, that's, that's the only big weakness yeah. I see. But that's why, if they're not doing good, that's why you're bringing them in. And, and talking to the families about how we can help. And they can sign a waiver to order that, but they have to. We, we do want that experience because we rec recognize and respect that some families 
have reasons that they need to be at home. And so we are, we are trying to have this as a process where not only do we have you know, the letter that will discuss our concerns, but we also are requiring that the schools reach out individually and have meetings to talk this through. So what supports can we offer? Because we understand that each family has made a personal decision and we wanna really respect that choice. Um, on top of that, just to add, um, I have asked our principals to reduce the amount of high flex courses that are being offered and they're working on that now. And it's been quite helpful that we've had our team that's been helping with um, course scheduling and making sure that where we can do this, we will do this. And so we're really trying to not only support our families and their decisions, but we're also trying to support our teachers and the complexities of it, teaching in this time. Do you have more kids coming back in the school still? Yes. What's the percentage you have? It's idea? about 65% in brick and mortar now, up from about 48 at the beginning of the school yeah. year. Yeah. That was very interesting. Another good presentation there, Ms. Thank Wise. You. Thank you. Had a hard act to follow. Uh, Mrs. Surgeon. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Wise, for the presentation. Um, well, Dr. Simon has addressed the high flex issue I was going to mention. Um, I was, oh, I've spoken with several teachers, sat in several classes, and last week, although our teachers are doing a very good job mm, with nice. this heavy lift, it's mm -hmm. a heavy lift. Yes. Um, of late, I've had several to contact me and say this is, the high flex is very hard, especially mm -hmm. with the young children. Right. Yeah. The young children, the ele younger elementary mm -hmm. age students. And if there's anything that we can do to bring us out of that high flex and to just have an all digital or all brick and mortar class would be really, that's the, con the consistent thread no matter which school we've been, been to mm -hmm. um, and where the professionals were, east and west. And yeah. I, was, I was in Child's last mm -hmm. Monday and that's a kindergarten teacher told me that. Mm -hmm. We're working with all out. the schools. So I think yeah. you'll see a good number of them being uh, eliminated or certainly the numbers reduced. Yes. You can't eliminate them completely based on the demand for the courses and right. also the need to have a digital option when students mm -hmm. need to go into quarantine. Yeah. And then the other thing um, is I do want students to, to come back because we realize that in-person learning is best. But I also at the same time want to, us to make sure our administrators are not forcing, like telling parents that they have to come in. The student has to come back because we really don't know the family situation. I had two parents that work in jobs that if their student is quarantined, they can't go to work, right. and that means they don't get paid. And so, for those of us who are income have incomes that are secure, it's easy for us to say just make them all come back. But if that student is then quarantined for the seven or 10 or 14 days, whatever it is, that parent can't work. And the lady said to me, when I don't go to work, I don't get a paycheck. Mm -hmm. So um, I want students to be in class because I do think it's the most engaging and, and most consistent, but there are some families because of health reasons um, and because of employment reasons, they may not be able to go back. So I do want us to be mindful of that as, as a district to that. We just don't make it be blanket and one size fits mm -hmm. all. And sometimes the students are home and they don't have the supports that they need. And I'm thinking, why aren't they in class? But when I had the, an elementary age student parent tell me that and a parent from a high school from Eastside, she's, we, if we don't go to work, we don't get paid. And if those students are quarantined, we have to stay home. You know, they're working in an assistant living type situation. Mm -hmm. So I, I, that's something to be mindful. Um, Ms. Ms. Wise, would you all give us a board, like later on, an update of what, like the baseline assessments from the students when they first came back to school and where we are when they, I, yes. I heard last week the Ames assessment, the second window, testing windows open. So when that data is available from that, would you all share that with the board so we can see kind of where we are and yes. we can kind of use that also as a tool as when we're out interacting in the community and really trying to mm -hmm. encourage um, families to really be engaged with their learners if the learners no matter where they are, because even students that are on campus, sure. some of them are distracted because yes. there's so much going on with that. Yes, you know, we'll have that quarter two Ames window closes February 12th. Okay. So after that, we can certainly provide that. And I think the message about the parental choice was made very clear uh, by Dr. Simon to our principals, so. Thank you, that's good to hear. Thank you for mm -hmm. the information for the update. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, Ma'am, uh, I had a question. Yes. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Wise as well. <laughs> One of the things, and I, I hope the numbers as far as did I know, I think that you, I'm asking this question, principals, I guess, or staff are sending those letters out to those students that are not doing well. Mm -hmm. I heard one number, I'm not gonna say it now, I'll ask you about it, but that's a really alarming if that's the situation. And so I know we, we're really working, hopefully we'll work with our families mm -hmm. and somebody who can really has a relationship with that family yeah. to encourage them back to brick and mortar. Yes, ma'am. Because I, I understand we, we, we want to stroke people, we do. We want to work with people. Mm -hmm. But oh my God, if that is a number that I heard, and most of those students are really struggling, you know, digitally. That that's on the digital with the digital academy, mm -hmm. that's alarming. And we're trying to educate people for the future. Right. <laughs> so um, it is. I would like to know what the numbers are. Yes, you get a chance. Okay. I know principals, I know they have to a uh, certain time give you those numbers. Mm -hmm. That was I just heard it from my one school. I was woo. I said, yeah. Oh my God. So they are, it, okay. there, there's a lot of students who are struggling with either attendance mm -hmm. or grades or mm -hmm. credits mm -hmm. or progress monitoring and our job is to address that yeah. need no matter right. what learning option they're in. But right. yeah, we have that information. Okay. We have it already because okay. those reports are what we need to send the letters home. Okay, all right, thank so you. I, so, I, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I think we've, we've run into, this is a very challenging needle to thread. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just personally, my husband um, passed away, but he was sick with cancer, and mm -hmm. I had young children at home. And I think about what my life would be like if that was occurring now. Yeah. And I think we, we, have, we have families who are probably going through similar situations, and so having their child come into school could really change a lot of complexities with the family and the safety of what's going on at home. I, and also, I have three children in school, mm -hmm. Um, you know, it, it's hard, I think, to perform well digitally and in brick and mortar right now. This is a tough year. And so I think what we're trying to do is manage this as best we can and make sure that we really just wrap around the services that we can with our students. Yeah. And so I appreciate um, definitely the points that you're making, but I think it's, it's complex and we're trying to just really go through this process as best we can, knowing that actually the the big heavy lifting will be when COVID is over and when we can actually get together and work really hard on all of this. Yeah, so I'm just concerned about especially our seniors, what the oh, grades yeah. are going to look mm -hmm. like, you know, where they're going. I mean, right. you don't have to take the ACT or the SAT, right. but you have to uh, still have the GPA to get into the university or college or whatever they're going on to. But Oh my goodness. So it, right. it was and our juniors who miss state assessment as 10th yeah. graders still have yeah. to have that test score too. That was just I know a waiver for last year. Best that we can. I just want to make Yes, ma'am. When I heard that one number, I was like, okay. All right. We'll work Thank you. It. Mrs. Wise, yes. um, if you will give um, kudos to your team, um, we are saying thank you to you right personally now but to all of the folks that have to uh, come together mm -hmm. and sit at the table with not only your team, but the administrators at the different mm -hmm. um, schools. Other than our DA schools, mm -hmm. middle as well as high, I'd like to know at some point in time um, for the students that are returning, what's gonna be different mm. for them that was not, was, I guess my question is, what would be different for them to return to brick and mortar than, and I heard what Mrs. Certain said, but that you were not giving them mm -hmm. digitally. Mm -hmm. I don't wanna come back if it's gonna be the same thing I was getting sitting in the, at my kitchen table with my computer. So I'd like to kind of have an idea mm -hmm. of um, what different um, locales are doing okay. for the children that are returning. Also, what will be our plan when um, testing resumes mm -hmm. and parents are not willing mm -hmm. to return mm -hmm. their children for the test? Right. So I know you all are working on probably some 
things yeah. that will motivate them to come back and sure. do the test. Or hopefully they'll feel safe, can create conditions where they feel safe to do so. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much. Thank you. Well, colleagues, it is now time for board members and superintendent announcements. Madam Chair, yes. Okay. Uh, first of all, I want to um, give a shout out. You all know this past week we had a um, reduced version version of uh, MLK activities, and uh, the weather was great. Um, and also, Dr. Simon, I want to thank her and uh, the board members who participated, Dr. McNeely and and um, uh, and the certain participated as far as on different programs that we had attending the gala. Um, but this past Monday, yesterday, uh, one of our students, and I hope she's listening, Taylor Hill Miles, she won uh, the uh, Edna M. Hart Keeper of the Dream Scholarship, and that was $7,500. And so she was excellent. Uh, I can say a student here that's extremely prepared, part of the IB program at Eastside, She's going to just, the sky is the limit for her. Outstanding young lady. She gave us uh, excellent speech. Um, and so I'm so thankful. And uh, Dr. Simon was there to witness it. And she participated and gave remarks uh, as well. And also as a board member, just want the community to know, um, visiting schools this week, I went to Stephen Foster and also had a chance to uh, visit um, juvenile court with Judge Bullard, <laughs> since that's one of the committees uh, that I've taken on as far as the board when it comes to juvenile justice. And I will tell you, uh, there is work to be done when it comes to, because all of these students are part of our campaign. And I, you know, I know um, one of the biggest concerns, we must do a enough is enough campaign that, you know, I've kind of reached out to the sheriff and GPD, DCF, and been talking to different judges. We got to reach out, you know, just that we're looking at our lower quartile. We have some kids that are still a part of our system uh, that we must reach. And so on Wednesdays, I will be attending a juvenile court and making some appointments. I've reached out to Ms. Carter and we'll be meeting with Mr. Brown to see how we come together as a team and get with the superintendent to make sure we're about all of the children. Because some of these kids, if we would have done something differently, they may not be where they are with the juvenile system. And that's all I'll say about that. I do have a request, but I'll, I guess, wait at that time for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'd like to um, thank you, um, Mrs. McGraw, for attending um, the ACCEPT training that we had this week, um, Mrs. Carter. I think Mrs. Um, Jones was with us at that meeting. Um, but we have much to do. We have much growing to do with the ACCEPT program. And um, I, I certainly want to thank um, the teacher, um, Mrs. Uh, Monroe, and I, I still say Davis, but to thank her for all of her willingness and the energy that she has put forth in trying to create stable, stableness, again, if that's a word, um, for bringing our children who may be new mothers or dads who may be new fathers and bringing the toddlers and babies to that program. If you are listening to me, I hope that you're speaking to your guidance counselors about what, all of the what ifs. And um, just know that we're going to have a parenting class starting uh, February the 1st. And we certainly want you to get enrolled if this is something that you are needing. All right? So um, at this point, we will move on into, we pulled the consent, but um, we're going to say that the superintendent recommends that the school board approve. Madam the, Chair. Oh, I'm so sorry. Input. Citizen input. Oh, oh my gosh. 
I would never. Thank you, Attorney Delaney. And we have two citizens. First of all, they have waited so patiently. Dr. Tessman, um, you're on. Today, my intern posed a question to our class, what makes you brave? Our students had some great answers, and when it became my turn, I said, I feel brave when I feel like something is wrong and I try to help. That is what I'm doing tonight. I feel like something is wrong and I'd like to help. I have a lot of concerns about the spring plan. My first three are concerns about continuing procedures that have already been in place in the fall plan. Number one is high flex teaching. This is when teachers teach students to both online and in person during the same class period. This is not something a teacher has a say in. If they are told to teach high flex, they have to teach high flex. This is putting a horrific strain on all educators who are teaching high flex. I hope that um, high flex will truly be reduced as it was suggested tonight. Number two, social distancing. There are too many people on a bus. This is endangering our bus drivers and our students and ultimately anyone who comes into contact with them. There are also too many people in classrooms. This is already established. So while we can look into it further with the task force, it's already happening and it needs to be worked on. Number three, we treat repeated refusal to wear a mask as a safety concern instead of a dress code violation. This may sound better, but it does not allow for discipline consequences to be assigned. Treating it as a dress code violation would help enforce the requirement to wear a mask. My first new concern tonight is that teachers are being asked to volunteer to tutor or teach after school and on Saturdays for a flat rate of pay. The rate is $28 per hour. Once our district raises the base salary of teachers to align as closely as possible with the minimum set by the governor, $28 an hour will be roughly consistent with the lowest teacher hourly rate. If a teacher were to work these extra hours, they would be working more than 40 hours a week. In a lot of other professions, this would equate to overtime. Unfortunately, in our county, this will equate to a reduction in pay for many. Teachers are being asked to do more for less. This is demoralizing and unacceptable, especially in a year where educators are risking their health and going above and beyond. I am concerned about the requirement to turn on cameras. Um, a lot of students who are likely to have a reason not to turn on their camera, whether they have a chaotic life at home or something else, um, are also the same students who are less likely to be able to turn in the paper to exempt them. Additionally, um, I urge that in the future, teachers be asked what technology they need. There is a touch screen being installed in my classroom and I do not teach there. Um, I could have used something else like Pear Deck, um, which is a great engagement tool and is also quite inexpensive. Um, there are many Digital Academy classes that are thriving. I welcome any of you to, to visit mine at any time. Please contact me and I would like to show you what we're doing. They're doing great things. And I do think the number of students underperforming is misleading because I was um, quoted as having six and I truly only agree with one. So if you ask the teachers, um, then the data is misleading in some instances and some children on that list are actually doing better than they did in brick and mortar. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. T Dr. Tessman, is it Crystal? Because you didn't give your name. I'm when sorry. <laughs> Crystal Tessman, that's for the, for the, rec for the recording. And what school, uh, Madam Chair, what school? Um, Dr. Simon. I, I was hoping I could just respond to that because I'm glad you brought those points up. Um, so for the high flex, we are asking teachers who are going to agree to sign on to teach high flex. So we have some form of a, a, a recognition that that's what the way they would like to do this. The hourly sal salary, we agree. We will take care of that. We'll discuss more about how this goes for everything else, but for our COVID response at this moment, we'll continue with that. Um, the signing for the camera, we are asking families to sign a release because we are running into just teaching a class with a bunch of blank black screens is challenging. So we'd like to find a, a happy medium. And so we're hoping we can negotiate this out with families. Come back to the mic, back please. To the yeah. mic. <laughs> I'm just used to having all the students hear me no matter what. Um, with the, with this, the black screen, one thing is a lot of times students have their camera on and the screen is still black. So this is gonna be challenging to determine who is not turning on their screen and whose screen is black because of the bad connection issue that they have. 
So that at least needs to be included. Um, we can hover over and it can say, um, ask student to turn on video. That would indicate that they do not have their video turned on. But if that's not an option, they've done everything they can and their connection or the connection at the school has just turned their screen black. So that's important too. I think we're gonna ask for kind of the grace and compassion through the process because I think we need to find a place in the middle and so hopefully we can work together on that. Thank you. Mrs. Ward. I'm Carmen Ward. I'm the president of ACEA and um, it is my, and thank you uh, board members and um, superintendent for giving me an opportunity to ad address some concern I have with the spring plan. Now, one of the first bullet points that um, Ms. Wise put up there was for financial continuity. And a lot of the worries that we had in the fall were worries that in reality, we do not have to be concerned with, like holding districts harmless for enrollment. And the spring plan, the $28 flat rate, I was a little unclear. <laughs> um, did you say you agree that that what is what it is? No, for this situation, mm -hmm. what, and we have to talk about stimulus money and moving forward, but because we want years of experienced teachers offering supports and services, mm -hmm. we, because of um, the summer training as well, we're gonna reflect that as well. So we're not gonna do the flat rate, we will do an hourly rate because our goal is to have high quality experienced teachers helping our students. Well, I'm here to say that makes me extremely happy because <laughs> um, that, that was disadvantaging veteran teachers once again and they are already um, feeling very, very disadvantaged by the TSA allocation from the governor. So I appreciate that and, um, and the other concern I had was the COVID leave. Um, in the fall, we had 20 days for employees and all the protocols and all the quarantine, no matter how it's enforced, if people do not feel like they can stay home when they're ill or that they can't miss work because they can't miss that paycheck, we are going to have a problem. We're, we, we need to, have COVID leave, and this is one of the issues on the impasse that I would like to pull so that we can continue to negotiate about it. Um, but we need to have COVID leave in the spring semester that is equal to what we had in the fall. I believe we only had 83 employees use it. Um, or I don't know if they used all of it, but that's what Mr. Purvis did, did, did share that with me. And I just wanted to bring that up too. With this spring plan, we have some negotiating to do to, um, to, to make the spring through the pandemic successful. But that's all. Thank you. I know we're not supposed to ask something, but real quick. We've, you've lo we've lost 10 days. They still have 10 days. Correct. They had a total of 20 in the fall. One was federal government. One was what we did. Madam Chair. Mr. Hyde. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, I have a question. Uh, I, I guess it, it's probably for Mr. Delaney, maybe Ms. Johnson, uh, but, but um, uh, if, I was under the impression, and, and I'm always fine with being corrected, uh, that when we talk about compensation, that that's a board decision, and that's something we do uh, where we negotiate uh, with the, our, our union. Uh, and uh, it, it seems, I, I, look, I can be wrong here, that we're, we're, we're talking in mm -hmm. public, a public negotiation of what we're gonna do, what we're not gonna do, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. Uh, I'm not uncomfortable 
necessarily with any figure, but I am uncomfortable with process. Uh, please help me out on this if, if you could. Well, I'm not a member of the bargaining team and I don't attend those sessions, but um, I think that you are correct that the bargaining process involves ultimately issues coming before the board in a private session to look at proposals from the union or, or the status of negotiations. We're at an impasse right now, um, although we have not completed that process fully where the board changes hat, so to speak, and has to um, fully resolve the issue. So uh, what I would tell you is that there can be discussions about possible future stimulus and money that may become available to the board, but ultimately these are gonna be the board's decisions um, through the collective bargaining process, although we're, again, we're in an impasse right now. Right. I don't know and if that addresses your question or not. It, I, it does, thank you, Mr. Delaney. Uh, Madam Chair, I just, uh, I, I, I wanna be, for us to be cautious, and uh, I don't want to appear to give promises uh, or indications that we may or may not be able to keep. Uh, I, I think we're all hoping that there will be significant stimulus money and, uh, and uh, I, I will have to get a report from Mr. Rella as far as what this is, can be used for. And, and so I, I just think it's uh, a little discomforting to uh, to say we're going to do something uh, when that's not the process. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, colleague Hyatt. Thank you again, citizens. Yeah, yeah. two. Yeah, we two do more. have two callers on the line for citizen input as well. All right, hold your point, um, Mrs. Neal, Mrs. Yes. McGraw. I, I, I was waiting until we got to the next one. I had oh, a question okay. about something. Then we'll go system. on with our call-ins um, from our citizens. Thank you so much. Um, citizens who are on the Zoom call, I'm going to provide virtual meeting instructions. We are being streamed live on YouTube for public viewing. That will also be made available on the district's website. Also, this meeting is being streamed through Zoom as an alternative method to provide comments during the public input session of today's meeting. Until such time as called on to speak, all participants are muted. During public input session of today's meeting, a person using Zoom can call via phone call, can push nine on their phone to virtually raise their hand. If participating online, you can click the raise hand online on the participants page to let us know that you wish to speak. When time for public input, I will either read the person's name or the last four numbers of the phone number and indicate that that person may now speak. Everyone will be given the three minutes to speak. After three minutes, an alarm will sound letting you know, or I will tell you, that the time is up. So first hand that was raised this evening is um, Armando Grundy Gomez. If you would please unmute. You are now on with three minutes with the board. Mr. Gomez. Can you hear me very clearly? Yes. Okay, thank you. Madam Chair, first and foremost, I want to uh, Thank uh, Mr. Purvis, Ms. Finley, um, Mr. Jacoby, and the rest of HR and staff. I want to let you know, Madam Chair, as well as the superintendent of the phenomenal job that they're doing, and uh, take the credit and understand and know. I think one of the board members was talking earlier about um, what HR could do about reaching out. Another thing that uh, Mr. Purvis is doing, Madam Chair, to reach out to another community that I did not hear one of the board members talk about we sometimes talk about different groups. We talk about race and demographics, but we don't talk about another group. We talk about veterans. And one thing Mr. Purvis was doing good was helping others and some veterans go through the process of becoming, you know, coming to work for the district and for the Alachua County Public School System. And I think it's a, a credit to him as well as Mrs. Finley. So I wanted to let you in, as well as the superintendent know uh, what he's doing. Is, I think it's phenomenal and, re and really great about how they're doing, and he should be uh, encouraged, and I hope the, the board will continue to encourage him, as well as the rest of them, and what they're doing. We could always do more, but we're doing what we can to try to encourage what we're doing, and if not, we try to help them where we can. On 
another note, I want, Madam Chair, I wanted to take a different approach in tone in that I keep hearing um, the mem one of the members from the ACPA, and uh, she keeps coming up there talking about an impasse and talking about dollars, talking about protecting members of, of employees, teachers, and staff. But I find it really rich for the nearly 18 months, we're going into nearly 18 months, over a year of dealing with this pandemic, and the silence was deafening coming from the ACEA when it came to select groups and members of demographics. So, you know, it's really interesting that you come now and talk about impact, but when we had certain members of our community, people that look like myself, people that look like the certain Mr. McGraw, Mr. Neely, Mrs. Ward was quite silent. The ACA was quite silent when it came to bus drivers, when it came to custodians. So we're gonna talk about an impasse now. So either we need to have a repealing and replacing of leadership because it's inept and floundering from the ACEA and they want to talk about an impasse when it comes that to the leadership stop. on this board and the school board. Your, your leadership was floundering and distant this board. And I think, you know what, those teachers- Sir, those please keep your comments away from a person. Okay, that's fine. That's we, the teachers deserve better. They deserve better They're leadership. Still doing it. They deserve better representation and they deserve better. And we should have better. So we need to have a repealing and replacing of teachers too for that leadership. And Madam Chair, also, I want to also commend the superintendent on her continued effort of going throughout the district and going to parents and to the community of all different areas of our county to continue to address this reorganization plan. Mr. Grundy Gomez, your three minutes is up if you'll wrap it up. Okay, I'm, I'm wrapping up. I want to follow the rules. I won't go over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next person with their hand raised in the meeting is Danielle Inglehorn. Ms. Inglehorn, you are on with the board for your three minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, uh, first of all, my, my name is Danielle Inglehorn. I'm a fifth grade teacher at Sweetie Parker Elementary. And um, before I begin, I just want to specifically comment on the, the speaker before me and just to say that Carmen Ward is working tirelessly on behalf of our bus drivers and custodians and all of our employees. And I'm going to be speaking to that impasse um, actually right now about the our salary increases. Um, and a part of this impasse actually has to do with the fact that our ESPs, um, the bus drivers, the custodians, the cafeteria workers, the paraprofessionals, have not really received um, comp like appropriate compensation in the offer that has been given to us. And part of our impasse is because we, we do not want to move forward unless we take everyone with us who deserves that. Um, now, three years ago, uh, I left a teaching job in Tyler, Texas to return to Gainesville, which is the town of my birth. And I had to undergo a pay cut of thousands of dollars. It was the decision that I stand by. I love this town, I love this community, but it has come with sacrifice. This year, we've been offered to raise all teacher salaries falling below 41,000 up to that amount, which is a good start. However, the only increase to veteran teachers of seven years and more who have given their sweat and tears and just made it past 41,000 is less than a 1% increase. And that doesn't even cover the cost of inflation. These are teachers who finally have the knowledge and experience to do their jobs really well and train the interns, the incoming teachers, and they are older individuals who usually spouses and parents trying to care for children and pay off mortgages. And the ESPs, our paras, the bus drivers, the cafeteria workers who support teachers every day and they were similarly neglected. In addition, this year our health insurance was cut back, our services are less, and our deductibles are higher during a pandemic of all times. Today during this meeting, someone discussed the stringent qualifications that teachers and parents must undergo. Teachers in particular are constantly having to prove our competence through our degrees, analyzing our student test scores, and adding to our certifications. We're expected to be experts at everything, from how to get our students to safety if a shooter is on campus, to evaluating our students' mental health and ensuring that those needs are met. And every teacher knows that if a student's social and emotional needs are not being met, doesn't matter how great our math lesson is, no learning will be done. 
Every year we're expected to do more, and this year, even more than any other year. And we're carrying the fragile emotional load of our students who are unequipped to live through a pandemic and, or, and social isolation while facing the pressure of ensuring that their scores are still high so that our school scores will not fall. Every year, veteran teachers, with all their wisdom and experience that provide the lifeblood of every school, must choose whether to keep doing what they love or leave teaching just so that they can provide for their families. Ms. Englehorn, your three minutes are up. Please wrap up your comments. Absolutely. I understand that finances are tight, but I ask that you find the money for this 3% increase for teachers and CFL. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Madam Chair, that's all the hands that were raised in the meeting. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, one just popped up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Right as I said it. Are you, is that okay? Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, the next speaker is Sherry, I'm sorry if I say this wrong, Sherry Roop or Rupe. Um, you are now on with your three minutes with the board. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, I work at Parker Elementary and I currently teach uh, second grade uh, digital academy and I will say this has been one of my most exciting years of teaching and I, I have taught for 15 years most of my teaching in Ohio and I've really gotten to know my students at a more personal level because I'm invited into their home and I cannot tell you um, how much I have enjoyed um, even though I cried the whole first week it was it's just been very encouraging um, these students are very resilient. Starting in February, I will have 10 students coming back and we will be high flex. Um, while I am excited, I am still very nervous and I would like to thank Dr. McNeely and Mrs. Certain for addressing some of the concerns that are coming up in the classrooms in the high flex settings. And one question was asked tonight, what's going to change? And, and that is what I would like to know, like what more are we offering them um, if we are doing high flex, I'm going to do my best to offer them what I can. Um, one more thing really quickly to piggyback on what the last speaker just said, and she did a beautiful job. I wish I had written a letter. Um, I moved here four, uh, four years ago uh, from Ohio, a small rural town, and I made uh, 13,000 more dollars a year, and I was awarded income, extra income for having a master's degree and a special education degree, which was called intervention intervention specialists in Ohio. Um, we don't get that here, and right now I, we're being told that incoming teachers will be making um, what I started making coming here with 11 years of teaching experience. So I would like you to please reconsider um, the negotiations with the board because there are lots of hardworking veteran teachers that also deserve to see their pay increase. And that's all I have tonight. Thank you again for letting me Thank you for your comments. Madam Chair, that is all. Okay, thank you, Mrs. <laughs> Neal. All right, and thank you to all of the citizens that called in and came in person. At this point, uh, we are now at the consent agenda and that the superintendent recommends that the school board approve the consent agenda as described with one, as you know, we pulled um, and Mr. Cottle will be doing that at a later time. And number eight, which is now an action item. Uh, a motion, please. So moved. Second. It has been properly moved and seconded. Uh, there any, is there any discussion? I, I had a question, uh, Madam Chair. About yes. Number 10, the 21st century. Um, Rollins was not included. I was just wondering why Rollins was not included. So Madam Chair, we were given an opportunity to extend that grant for five schools that mm -hmm. cycled out of the grant in 2019 and, and Rollins just was not part of that cohort mm -hmm. that they gave us the opportunity to renew. Yeah, it was asked. Some people called me from Rollins wanted to know why they weren't included. So as a new Yeah, we had a number of know. schools that were in a later cohort mm -hmm. that cycled out that we weren't offered that opportunity. Okay. 
If there is no more discussion, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5 0. Mr. Purvis? Yes, ma'am, Madam Chair, Board Members, Madam Superintendent. For employee case 2021-0201-14, the superintendent recommends that the school board suspend the employee with pay. Mr. Purvis, excuse me, that's the one we pulled. No. Well, no. that's the one Mrs. Hitt. 13 was pulled, yes, ma'am. 13 was pulled. Okay, 13, yes, and what number did you say? 14. I do apologize, I'm, Mr. Purvis. Well, I'm sorry I had to get in front of you twice. <laughs> it's all right. It's all right. The superintendent recommends that the school board suspend the employee with pay for a period not to extend, exceed 90 calendar days. Such suspension to continue thereafter without pay, pending termination proceedings for employee case 2021-0201-14. What'd you do with the first one, 13? Sir? What about the one before that? 13, we the employee pulled, resigned. We pulled out. They pulled, okay. We pulled it, yes, sir. So what do you do? That's, that's number one now. Well, we are on the one that ends in 14. Right, but then where does the, where does the uh, number 10 from the um, uh, number, consent agenda go? The, the action item that was number eight will come um, Supposedly at number two. Okay, number two. That would be the next one. If if Mr. Perkins <laughs> has completed, that, well, we have to move with the vote first. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think what Dr. Andy did was all the employee cases. She was showing us one. That's what okay. Sounds like. All right. Second. No second. Second. Okay, I didn't hear you. I'm so sorry. I didn't hear you. Uh, it has been properly moved and seconded. If there's no other discussion, all in favor? Aye. 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 All right. And um, motion uh, passes 5 0. Yes, ma'am. So on your board agenda, it's action item number three, but it's actually action item number two. Mm -hmm. So for employee case 2020 20 21 0101-20, the employee recommend the superintendent, excuse me, recommends that the school board terminate the employee effective January 20th, 2021. So moved. Second. Second. It's been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. All right, Mrs. Certain. That's number two. That's what we're going to use now. Number eight. Class number eight. Okay. Yes. Motion on this part. Um, before you speak, Mrs. Neal, Mr. Hyde just reminded that um, we have not had a motion for three or twenty. Mr. For the class size amendment compliance. Mr. Hyde. Well, yes, ma'am. I was just, since this is something we're going to vote on before we have discussion, I believe we should have a motion in a second. Uh, if I've got the nod from the person that really knows. So, uh, so okay. smooth that we um, receive the class size reduction compliance plan. So okay. Second. 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 It's been oh, dropped. The doctor, uh, sorry, well, Dr. Paul said that. So <laughs> raise. He said, he, he did. It's been <laughs> properly moved and seconded. No discussion. If none, seeing none, all in favor? No, 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 no discussion. No. Discussion. She, Mrs. Neal. <laughs> you are wonderful. No, no, I'm not. Not tonight. <laughs> Go right ahead, Mrs. Neal. Thank you, Mr. Hyde, for bringing it to my attention. Well, thank you. So I know this was a point of clarification question, so I'm going to just review that very quickly and then answer whatever questions come with that. So student class size is done through the survey two, which is our October FTE survey. And those are the counts that are used for our class size mm. uh, to be calculated for the year. This year we do have two of our Alachua County Public Schools that were
were above class size, one being Alachua Elementary with reported class sizes in grades kindergarten through third, remember they're third through fifth, so it's really only their third grade that was counted there, with a class size average at the time of survey two of 20.5 instead of the required 18, and Hawthorne Middle High School was over class size in grades four through eight, or in this case grades six through eight, with a class size average of 23.13 instead of 22.0. We are required to submit a class size compliance plan no later than February 1st that explains the actions the district will take to ensure compliance in the following year. The state has not given that template yet, but it will be due at that time. And so we're bringing it as an informational piece for you this evening that we do have to do those compliance plans. And I can tell you that the Alachua Elementary was, um, they had very many more students than they expected in their third grade, and they have since hired and the count is down. Um, however, by survey two, it was not down. So that's um, the case with Alachua. And with Hawthorne Middle High School, again, it was their middle school classes, not their high school classes, that were over class size. And Ms. Wise and I have been working with the school on scheduling and working through how that those allocations are being used to get that class size down. And uh, their plan is to do some rescheduling for the second semester. Um, question. Okay, six through eight, are they in block scheduling too? Hawthorne does block scheduling um, for the majority of their classes. What do you mean majority? They're all now? Okay, I'm sorry, all. <laughs> I have no idea you do that. Yes, all. all At right. one time they were doing some that were not, but they're, they're all blocked now. Okay, so the, which is, you know, you, gotta, you don't have as many, you, you don't have as many teachers or Experience. Right, you don't have as, as many periods in your day to have as many sections yes, as some other schools would. They teach three, right? Three, or if they're a four fourths and getting that extra, some are teaching four so fourths. So you have four, te four teachers then compared to six. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. That, that, that got, that may be the problem. Yes, sir. It does cut down on the opportunities for sections for scheduling. Okay, that's what I was thinking. All right, thank you. Is it certain? And my question, Ms. Neal, I, because we didn't have it, we only had the one sheet, and I wanted to know how we were going to address the yes. overages, is what I was asking. That was what my question was. So, a lot of joy, if I understood you correctly, they hired the teacher. Yes. They didn't step down. Okay. And Hawthorne was still working through that. They are working yeah. through rescheduling, doing some rescheduling for second semester. We were so far into the semester, mm -hmm. and with the block schedule, especially, we were worried about credits and the students getting all of their credits if we had to do too much rescheduling in the middle. They did some rescheduling to try to, to reduce counts. Um, so they're really working on it on a semester plan so it didn't impact credits for students. Thank you. You're welcome. Wait, one more thing. Mm -hmm. yeah, block scheduling is more expensive. That's why we did away with, we had seven middle schools on block scheduling, remember? And it is good, I mean, but it's still expensive. It has benefits and it has probably cons as well. Pros and cons as well. What did you say? It said it has benefits and it probably has some, some cons as well um, for, for each school. So as we look at that as we go into the spring um, with what they plan to do for next year, I'm sure that would be addressed again at that time if necessary. Well, I mean, I think it helped help Hawthorne get out of their problem. Mm -hmm. so it's worth yes, it. Sir. Seeing no other questions Thank you, at I this appreciate point, that. may I have a motion? We've already, we just we a motion. Then I thought you all stopped me. No, we, we did the motion. This We're is discussion. We just need to vote. All right. Vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes 5-0. Mrs. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. You all have a copy of the 2021 legislative program that was developed after the board workshop yeah. last week. Yeah, uh, the superintendent recommends that the school board approve yeah. the 2021 yeah. legislative priorities as presented. So moved. Uh -huh. Um. Mrs. Johnson, before um, we move for the vote, I mean, um, carry the vote through, everything is excellent. Um, and 
Last year, it was trifold, was it not? No. It was still just yes, single fold like this? Yes, ma'am. This is wonderful. All right, um, so at this point, it has been properly moved and seconded. Any discussion? Madam Chair, I just concur with you that I think it's outstanding. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you, Ms. Johnson. And now let's move to um, D. Johnson. Oh, I'm sorry, Attorney Johnson. For the record, Diana Johnson, staff attorney. Um, I'm here presenting agenda item number five, which is titled Professional Service Fee and Project Construction Costs. Um, this is regarding vehicles, high school athletic association um, improvements. Um, in November, there was a board member request to bring this agenda item back before you. So there's no staff or superintendent recommendation that goes along with this agenda item. We're simply bringing it back before you at the request of a board member. Um, at that time, there was a vote and approval of an option um, for transparency of the public. And just as a refresher for you, we have listed on the agenda those options uh, that were presented at that time. And option two was selected. Um, you're certainly welcome to speak with Mr. Delaney, but he and I have uh, communicated a bit just to um, let you know that the board does have the ability to um, move tonight to rescind the previous action. You can move, uh, second it, and adopt a different option, um, or you can simply decide to take no action at all, and in that case, the November uh, decision that was made will stand, and that's the one that the staff will follow. Are there any questions? I have, Madam Chair. Um, Mrs. Surgeon. Um, Attorney Johnson, thank you. Should I make two motions or one motion? Yes, ma'am. So two if separate you do, motions? Okay, if there so is the first a motion would be to rescind the vote from November 3rd, and the, the second motion that I would make would be for whatever option I would like to present first. Yes, ma'am, that would be appreciative. Correct. I just wanted to confirm that. Yes, ma'am. Mrs. Surgeon. Okay. Madam Chair, I move that we rescind the vote that was taken on November 3rd, 2020 for the Behost Athletic Project that was option two. Um, as Attorney Johnson just um, explained to us. Second. It has been promptly moved and seconded. Um, discussion, if any. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Hyatt. Okay, thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, if, if we sort of go back in history a little ways, uh, I, I'm so old, I graduated from Gainesville High in 1969. At that point, um, hard to believe that was 52 years ago, but at that point, uh, we had Citizens Field. And at that also, there was only half of the stadium, but we had wooden bleachers on the east side, and we had the, the newer, uh, you, you know, it looks like the uh, uh, Roman amphitheater on the other side. We, we, now we have two of those. Um, and now we have a whole lot more schools. At the time, I think you had Gainesville High, you had Lincoln, you had uh, P.K. Young using that field. Um, and, and then when uh, the fateful day that Doug Dickey came to University of Florida, uh, we got artificial turf at Florida. And that really put a, a halt on development because for about 20 years, the schools were able to use Florida Field, and we also obviously still have Citizens Field, and then of course PK Young, which isn't our our own school, built their own stadium. Uh, but um, uh, you know, I, I think we're sort of living in the past, uh, and uh, we had a thorough discussion uh, on. Uh, on this, I don't think we need need to rehash it. Uh, I, I I think that we we had a uh, a, a very solid presentation uh, that's that sound financially. Uh, I you know if you if you look, Buholtz was I, I believe Dr. Paulson will tell me exactly, but I think they opened the fall of 1971, and, and that's a whole long time. No, they opened the fall of 70. Okay. The uh, building fall, opened uh, January uh, Okay, fall of 70. So uh, 
it, it's not like we're spending money hand over fist on athletics there. Uh, and and um, so I, I'd like to see us stay with the decision that was made. Just because the decision was made in November doesn't mean it was a bad decision. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm a music guy. I'm an arts guy. But there's no doubt in my mind that athletics mean uh, so much to the community, mean so much to these young people, and that we have many young men and women that graduate uh, and are successful in high school because of athletics. And so I think uh, it, it's uh, a, a good investment uh, for our district and, and mainly for our children. So with that, uh, I, I appreciate uh, being able to speak, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyde. Dr. Paulson. First of all, the option was to have it in two years, so it's not written right here. When I made the option, what we presented was it could be having a two-year uh, time, time frame. So the track could go in and then the bleachers and stuff could go in after that. So I think that needs to be corrected. The next thing is it was the only thing presented that would pay for itself. When I was at uh, GHS, we had to play St. Pete Lakewood at Hawthorne. And when I was at Buells, we played games out at Santa Fe. This is a, uh, a, 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 a uh, something that's worthwhile. It's something that pays for itself. I, I hate to say, I was head football coach at Gainesville High School, and I liked Gainesville High School, but they spent over $3 million in the 90s on Gainesville High School and nothing on, on, on Buells. I was athletic director at Buells. I put the lights along with Mr. Klein and, uh, at Buholz, and we paid for it. The school district didn't pay a penny. I put the air conditioner in Buholz weight room they're still using. Didn't cost the district a penny. This is something that's well, well needed. And in and time frame, it'll um, pay for itself. Just like the lights. When we put the lights, the district turned around and gave Eastside and Gainesville High and almost $100,000 a piece lights. So that's $100,000. Remember I said that Buholz paid, that nobody else paid. So I mean, again, I was, I was, uh, you know, I was head football coach at Gainesville High and had some good times. But Buholz has not been treated fair. And it's good for the district. Now, if you want to, I hope the people from Buholz are watching and see what happens if we turn it, if we change this. What's happening is they don't want to do anything for you if they, if they vote this down. You hold, they just have to keep doing everything for themselves. They should at least get the track. That should be the first thing. It should already been started. It's been three, what, two and a half months. I don't know why it wasn't started. Uh, and if it had been started, this is a moot point. So, um, I mean, I gave you all the figures. If you can look these people in the eye and, and tell them you don't care, you know, they just, they're going to be treated the same way they've always been treated. They get nothing. Madam Chair. I want, wait, I'm still speaking. This is, this is important. This is something. How much money we save by putting the lights on Buholz's football field, at what we paid for, has saved the, at the wear and tear on Citizens Field, and how much money just on bus trips alone over the last 25 years. So, you know, I think I try to do things for kids, not take away. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Paulson. Um, Mrs. McGraw? Yes, Madam Chair, uh, thank you. Um, as someone who was sitting in the audience at that time, um, when you look at the options and having a chance to speak to other track coaches, one of the things we're going to have to be, uh, make sure we do as a board, we're going to be fair across the board. Um, and someone who visited and who's been a part of this system a long time, 
at Gainesville High School, you gave them four hundred and some thousand dollars. Santa Fe, you gave them four hundred and some thousand dollars. So it's only fair that you can you give Buholtz four hundred and some thousand dollars. Mr. Paulson, I'm talking about the track. And uh, excuse me, I didn't interrupt you, so don't interrupt me. You, you, you let me speak. And so we're going to learn to be fair across this board. And one of the things, if, if I can afford to do something and people donate, you donate because you want to do what's best for children. And when you start saying, well, I donated this much and I donated this much and I need to have all the control and all of the power, I'm just talking about what parents say to us as board members too. We have to learn to be fair. And so the behavior and the pattern when we make these decisions, they need to change. And so to be fair, and that's my opinion, and I'm entitled to my opinion. Whatever we did, we're going to be fair. And when you talk to other people and they come, I was there that night when we had that discussion. And so, Madam Chair, I think we need to be fair across the board, and we need to make sure we're giving sort of the same money. If somebody can donate it to us, Hallelujah. Thank you. When I donate, everybody up here is doing what's best for children. But for us to say, or someone to make a comment, that now you're telling parents at Buholtz and stuff that you don't care, that's not a fair statement to me. That's my opinion. And so at this point, I would, I would, I would agree with the motion and that as we move forward, we vote on option one. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just stepping in here, I got to answer that. Oh. I got to answer it. I'm sorry. G GHS got three million dollars. Mrs. Certain had okay. her hand on. Now I can answer, answer her. Because that's, that, that's got to be. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, to the citizens and to my colleagues, um, on November 3rd, I said, stated that I'm an athlete and I support athletics in our county. My children played athletics, were athletes, and my dissension to this has nothing to do with me not supporting children, not supporting Buholtz or whatever. I left my notes, unfortunately, that I read back in November at home today. But briefly, I will say that the point that I made back in November was that when staff went around in the community and advocated for the passage of the half cent sales tax, the citizens, I was a citizen then, and I was told, I sat in many of workshops and said that we needed to use the Hassett sales tax as well as the 1.5 mills to cover the extensive list of projects at our various schools. We, even citizens, from someone from Newberry emailed and said, why wouldn't we do doing something at this? And the response was, was that we, when this, the tax was rolled out and the capital funds, we said that we would use the funds for classroom spaces and things that's in the balance, that athletic facilities would not be um, addressed at this time. That is my dissension. And at that time, I said that we need to make sure that we are, don't have scope creep on a lot of projects. I detailed out the, the current projects that are in process that are over budget from what their original estimates were and that we needed to be very cautious in how we added things to the project list so that when we got down to years, the later years in the, pro, in, in the sales tax initiative that we did not run out of money and that project schools and projects that were slated for the latter part of the sales tax collection period would not get shorted. So in that discussion, I, I implored my colleagues if you all will recall that we do what we've done at the other schools, at Santa Fe and at Gainesville High School, is that we rubberize the track and we use the same arrangement that we made with those two schools when they came to us, or came to you all, because I wasn't a board member at that time, that they would repay whatever the excess was. I'm not against athletics anywhere. I'm not, it's not that I don't want to do anything. It's about doing what we told the taxpayers that we would do. And right now, as I said, we have several projects that have been, they've run over. Our facility staff can confirm that. So I don't want there to be scope creep and we're us adding things up here now in the second year of the sales tax collection and then we get down and there are some things that we can't do because we did this project here. So that, that's, that is, that's my comment. Thank you. We'll go to Dr. Paulson and then my comment. Well, you, uh, 
first of all, Dr. McNeely, you were part of putting it where you could be paid for out of the 1.5 mil. You remember that? We, you wanted to make some improvements at uh, how efficient. But I, I rescinded and that's that. That's all right. I mean, but that's what it came from. And it wasn't part of a, I don't think, know? wait just a minute now. Okay. Don't say that, that it, because this was established with our former superintendent, our former, former superintendent. What was, what was established? Um, the stadium and, no. oh, okay. No, I, no, I have those no. records. <laughs> yeah, well, so do I, you know I do. The thing about it is, look, Ms. McGraw said that we'd be fair. I went over, if she was in the room that day, if she can say this is fair, it's unbelievable. <laughs> because we spent two over $2 million on that track just to build it in the 90s. We spent half a million dollars to put that tennis court up by the road. We have never spent any money on Beatles. And I, you know, like I said, I was the head football coach at Gainesville High, pretty successful too. And the thing about it is, it's not, if you want to be fair, this is not fair if they don't get these bleachers. Because you haven't done anything for that school. I've been here, I've been in this district long enough, I've been part of people raise, raising the money. Nobody donated those lights. We went out, I went out with Mike Klein was here, you heard, Breck Weingart, and we went there and we got those lights, and got them up, and then the other district schools because if you said fair, they got, then they got it paid for. I'll never forget Tony, Terry Two guys on it. I said, you owe Buell's $100,000. He goes, oh, you're a visionary. It's, and I'm saying, Buell's, this is a good business deal. It's gonna pay for itself. And you heard the track coach talk about track. If you wanna have big track meets here, you need good bleachers so you can have people there. Once this, the COVID's over, now, I, obviously, I can see which way it's going, the thing, but I'm not going to be quiet about it. I've worked in this district. I, I started here 50 years ago, 51 years ago. And I've seen what, you know, I've seen what we haven't gotten. And I just think if, you know, now you have something to do for some kids and people and be, make a good business deal, and it should be done. At least, you know, I hope we get done. If you vote me, vote me down, is that we at least get the track for them. And I think the old view holds $400,000. You know, they paid for those lights. You paid for the other people's lights. You owe view holes 100 grand. So you ought to be view holes, that 40,000, that paid for it. They'd be done paying for the track. And I want people to hear that. I know what money's been spent. And just to say it's not fair, it's not fair the other way. And I gave you the facts. I just didn't give you my opinion. So anyway, that's, that's what it is, you know, and I, and I want to, listen, I want people to know what's gone on in this district. And Mr. Hyatt, the reason we got to play in Florida Fields because the school district put the foundation down for the AstroTurf, that's the start of the program. And, uh, you know, I mean, I, I really, I, it's, you know, where was everybody when, you know, this is, like I said, it's a good business deal. Gainesville High, East Side got lights. 100 grand is given to them. You know, like I said, this would make it where you save money for East Side and Gainesville High, because chances are you wouldn't have Thursday night games. Thursday night games don't make any money. And it's, you save money on bus rides, everything. So just because you don't want to do it, I mean, I think you're wrong. I think it's terrible what you're doing. Terrible. So anyway, probably doesn't help my case to say that. <laughs> no, I'm going to speak, and then we're going to call for the vote. Principal Tenbig, I'm so glad that you're here. I did. I don't know what Well, I know, I know. <laughs> but I, I did answer you through email. I hope that you received that. And um, I do um, support what Mrs. Certain had said um, back before uh, colleague McGraw got on that we would certainly be in favor of rubberizing 
um, that track um, at Buholtz, just like we did at Santa Fe High and Gainesville High School. So I, I hope that you, you have heard all of the comments that we've made, and I'm calling for the vote. Um, Madam Chair, uh, 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 I had another comment based on what another board member said, and and uh, no, we are not gonna. We are not. Go I'm not going to have us at each other tonight. I'd, I'd like for a motion. I'd like to hear what he has to say. He, you can, um, with the with a, the both attorneys. Um, oh. May I have a motion? Excuse me. I've already made the motion. We already made you the had motion. a motion. Second. All right. We've had the discussion. Second. We've had all in oh. favor, starting with Miss Certain. Ms. Dr. Paulson? No. Mr. Hyatt? No. Mrs. McGraw? Yes. And um, yes for me. So, uh, I have so a point just of a, order. Just, I just have a, a point minute, order. Mr. Mr. Hyatt, you can have the point a of point order. Point of order. I... Just a minute. Now, we are looking at the second motion that you had, Mrs. Certain. Madam Chair, I move that we move forward with the Behold's track resurfacing project, which if I am reading this correctly, it will be option one, phase one, the projected amount being 473,790 that's in here, um, the packet that's here. Second. It Madam has Chair. been properly moved and seconded that we move forward with the rubberizing of the track at the amount that was stated. Um, Attorney, you, you had a statement. I would recommend before we go into discussion regarding um, the motion that's on the floor, we yes. address Mr. Hyatt's point of order because uh, I'm not sure what he's raising a point of order about, but before we get into the discussion regarding the motion, we probably ought to address that point. As of order. long, uh, Attorney Delaney, as long as it's not going to prolong the discussion that we each board member has had an opportunity to say one or two different comments as lo as long as he's stating for which motion well, well that's the thing i don't know what the point of order is about so i think well, we should probably uh, take that up uh, uh, madam chair my point of order and, and i'm not sure why we have workshops on parliamentary procedure if we don't follow them uh is, is that um, we have a, uh, I had a response to what Ms. Certain said, and I was, I was not allowed to, to, before the vote, and of course we know it wouldn't have made a difference, but I was not allowed to make my point. And that, and so my point of order is that I was cut off, and, and believe me, uh, I don't speak for 20 minutes. I've got about two minutes or less to say, and and uh, the idea that we're just going to cut a board member off because you've decided it's time to vote, uh, I, I don't, uh, you know, I respectfully do not agree with that, Mr. So, Chair, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I had called the question at uh, the time because we, we had whole, discussion, oh, so I don't know what that. So we were, we're, is this well, revisionist now? When, when do we start calling the question? Well, you can. We <laughs> can do things the same way. Uh, so, a board member, uh, Mr. A board Hyatt, say what you needed to say, even though the vote has been taken. Go on for the record. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, uh, Ms. Certain was talking about how uh, what was promised with a half cent sales tax. Uh, I went to a whole lot of workshops. I went to a whole lot of meetings, and uh, we did not promise. We did not advertise in the half cent sales tax. Uh, that where we're going to close the school and move that school. We, we advertise we're gonna have a brand new school in, so in, 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 in the western part of the county. So, so I think it's, a, 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 to use another board member's term, it's a little rich to, to say that this is somehow a violation of, of, of public trust because this wasn't exactly uh, what was advertised? So, uh, so my point is, uh, we, we've ar that we've already crossed that bridge uh, because when we voted last week, we voted uh, to do something that was not 
advertised in the half cent. So that's all. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And now, uh, Matt, Attorney Delaney, are Matt. we now back at the voting? No, well, we have, I haven't had a chance to speak on that mo this motion. Uh, no, 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 Matt. no, no. I, I'm saying I was going to give you an opportunity, right. Dr. Paulson, to have discussion on the motion that Mrs. Certain and Mrs. McGraw just seconded. Yes, ma'am. We are at that point. However, Ms. McGraw has called the question. So that requires a it should be addressed immediately. It requires a two-thirds vote, which on this board would require four board members to vote to call the question right now. So it's my understanding that Ms. McGraw was calling the question, I called the question. on this, on on this currently that? pending motion, which we, has not been discussed. But so, Madam Chair, what I would recommend that you do is see if we have four board members who are ready to vote on Ms. Certain's motion to approve option one for view holds. And if we don't have four board members, then we go into discussion. I thought she was calling the question for the first uh, motion when we were talking about the stadium, not the rubberized track. She's shaking her in that head now. <laughs> I was trying to move on. All so, right. So well, the, the question is called, do we have four board members who are ready to immediately proceed to a vote and skip over discussion regarding whether Buholt should have option one. And option one, let me be clear, option one would be the rubberizing of the track? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, and everything else that's included on the agenda under um, action item five here. We will have a roll call vote uh, starting with Mrs. Certain. You mean on the call to question? On the right? call for yes. the question. I, I'm okay with discussion. And then I say no because that's discussion. Say. Right. So a, a no vote. No is would, discussion. No is a, a no. call for further discussion. Right. All right. So Certain. no and no. No and no. No. Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. All right. So the, the call to question failed, so now we would move into discussion. Okay. Dr. Paulson. Well, the next thing on this one, I don't think, I don't think GHS and Santa Fe paid $473,000 for their rollerized track. They have not finished paying for it. No, they, they, was never, they never had to pay that much. Well, That's never been the, the cost. It depends, I thought, on the lanes and, and that kind of thing and any extra, um, I forget what they call it, on the sides that Mr. Coward helped me with that, um, that you had, oh, Mrs. Um, when I saw you ease up. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, and Super, Superintendent Simon. I'm Suzanne Wynn. The actual portion of the track that GHS and Santa Fe paid was for the rubberizing portion only of the track. So that was not the entire cost. Okay. So are you saying that for view holes, this would be more than just rubberizing? It would be for the whole track? Yes. Thank you so much Why for that it, clarification. What, what do you mean? Why would it cost more? I didn't see that, I think. I wish I had this in front of me. I don't understand the question. I'm I don't sorry. see how it could cost more. Because she said at she GHS explain. and Santa Fe, they only had to lay rubber on the tr Well, maybe I misunderstood the question. Yeah, okay. okay, so the total cost for Buholtz is the 425000 The portion that Buholtz would be responsible for, the school would be paying back, is the portion that would be for the rubberizing, which for GHS it was $145,400. For Santa Fe it was $108,050. So oh. it really depends on the school, the number of lanes. The rest of the cost is for the, the base improvements and the asphalt and such as that. The things that have to be done prior to laying the rubber on the track. So how much is the going to be charged? We won't know that till we go through design and actually well, bid the project. 
So right now we have the estimate of the architect at and their fees and construction cost estimates at the amount that you're approving that that is up for approval tonight. The next step will be to go through design and then bid the project and that's when we'll have exact cost. And then that comes back well, to see, the we're board We're voting for on something we don't even know why it costs more all of a sudden than the other, other, other track. See, it's just an eight lane track, few holes an eight lane track. The, it's and not. has got an asphalt track. GHS had an asphalt track. It is, it's not costing more, sir. Well, then they shouldn't have to be charged for the right. If, they, if, they, if he knows what he's getting, and he's willing to pay for something extra, but it has to be extra. It can't be just charging them more money. They're, they're they need being, an explanation. They would be charged for the rubberized portion of the track nothing else. So you'd be looking at a pr using GHS numbers and Santa Fe numbers. The 1.5 mil would cover $275,000 approximately up to 425. The school would be responsible for the difference for the rubberized portion. Okay, that's it if, all. Right. If that, those, so they're going to be responsible for what? A hundred and something thousand dollars? It's going to depend on the final design and how the bid numbers come we in. We should have had it then. I mean, but how much? It's not going to be much more, right? It's, it's probably going to be close to the GHS costs. Okay, that's uh, not what. <laughs> that's 145000 for right. the rubberized portion. The entire scope of the work for all the construction and the design is $425,320. The school is only responsible for paying back the rubberized cost portion of that of that total cost. Are you, all right? you understand that exactly? Can we talk to the principal? Um, just a minute before we answer that, Mrs. Surgeon. That's so correct. GHS, which was Coach McNeely and Coach Tommy Turner from Santa Fe came, and they made a presentation and they said they would pay the additional cost of the rubberization. In that meeting, I don't recall them being given the exact figure, but they did say that they wanted to have the rubberized track because they felt it was safer for the athletes to come up to, to run on, to compete on. And so, um, that's what I understood. I don't recall them being given like an exact figure, but they knew they had some time period. I don't, I don't recall what it was. If it was five years, 10 years, I don't know that. It, but this board, the board that was sitting at that time, told them that they had to pay that additional cost over the asphalt. That is correct. That's the $145,400 for GHS and the $108 and $50 for Santa Fe High School. Those, that's, those are the amounts for the rubberized portion that the schools were well, responsible for paying back. In that ballpark is all that people should be responsible for, let alone the 100000 I say you still owe them. But it's uh, that's, not that $473,000. That's not what we should be voting on to pay back. That's the cost of the project that we're approving. That's what the cost of, that's what they're presenting to us. They're not telling us, oh, it's only going to cost this the amount the rubberized because they're going to have to make expenditures through finance or whoever going to have to say, well, what, did the board approve this but project? What Buholz is responsible for is just the rubberized part of the track, which would probably be in the vicinity of $140,000, correct? That is correct. That, now that's worded specifically. So that's all they're going to be responsible for. But it's my understanding what you're looking at right now to approve is the project itself, which is the design and the construction. So once the board approves this, if you approve it, we'll move forward with design, create construction documents that will then go to bid, which will give us the exact numbers. We'll have an exact number for the rubberized portion, and when we bring it back to the board, those numbers will be exact and specific, 
and that's when that portion of the rubberized piece will be known the exact cost. Right now, all we have is the estimate, which is 145. It's going to be equivalent. It's in the ballpark of GHS because of the size. But then they want to get what I suggested the two year period. They want to have their track sooner than later. At least get the track. It's soon, I don't it, understand why we didn't have that figure when we came here. You know that? But that's okay. As long as they're not going to be responsible, as long as we get, at least get started on the track. They will be responsible for the rubberized costs. That's what, that's what I understand Ms. Wynn to be saying. Yeah, that's not how it really Madam Chair? Yeah. Yes, go right ahead. Yeah, I, 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 I think that how this works is that the board, if they choose to approve this motion, it will be put out to bid and design. Specific numbers will be brought back and the board will then be able to address from a past history standpoint, an equity standpoint, and everything else, how they intend to um, have a portion of the cost, whether it's the rubberized uh, portion, there will be a later day for the board to address and finally consider that when they have the exact figures in front of them. I, I think all the board members now are expressing what their intent or what they how they would prefer to see this handled. That's a step for a later day once the design and the contract and the, the bid figures are in front of the board. Thank you, Attorney Delaney. Thank you, Mrs. Wynn. Mm -hmm. May we, I think we've had a motion already yes. and a second, and so we're ready for the vote. And this is for the rubberizing of I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I, I, I just wanted to clarify, and I may have spoke too soon. This is to address option one under yes. part five mm -hmm. to approve facilities to go put that out to bid and get it designed and bring that information back to the board for final decision. And like she said, well, specifically, they will only be charged for the rubberizing of the track. Well, that's what we had said before. When, um, the it's not what it reads. That's what. Okay. All right. And what I would what I would tell you is that 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 is not in this issue right here. If if the board wants to vote tonight to say sight unseen without knowing what those costs are going to be, they're going to hold um, few holts harmless for any portion. They could add that to this motion, but I don't think that that's in option one right now. No. Uh -uh. So I, I, what has been motioned and seconded is just option one, which directs facilities to go get specific numbers and bring it back for, and for the board to figure out how they want to deal with it. All right. Hearing the um, explanation from attorney David Delaney. <laughs> May we now have the vote? Aye. Can you come back to me? Aye. Aye. And aye. Aye, aye. Thank you. Um, the motion passes 5-0. At this time, we are back at citizen input. Yes, ma'am. We do have one caller on the line um, for citizen input via Zoom. If you're ready for that at this point. Okay. Um, Armando Grundy Gomez, you are live with the board for your three minutes. Um, just a minute. Um, oh, in the past, yes. Yes. Um, yes. we have had Previous and ending. Yes, we can. I'm sorry, that was my understanding as well. Um, so Armando Grundy Gomez, 
You are live with the board for three minutes. This is um, Neil, as long as he's not going to call any names. Yes, ma'am. I don't see, he's not responding. Make sure I'm not muted. No, I'm not. One last turn. Armando Grundy Gomez, are you there? I'm not getting a response. All right, thank you. Um, we are now at discussion. Oh. Um, principal uh, Ten Big. Wow. Madam Chair, fellow board members, Superintendent Simon, I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you uh, this evening. Uh, a good friend of mine sat in that chair, one of those chairs, not too long ago, and she told me at one time, before you make any decisions, always ask yourself, what is good for kids? If it's good for kids, then you should go ahead and go with your decision. The way I understood the, uh, the development of the track was that equity would be shown from what GHS received and what Santa Fe saw. We at Buholz have already raised sixty to $65,000 towards the rubberization of the track, okay? From those donations, many of the, uh, the donors have already graduated from Buholz. Uh, so, you know, I'm glad to see that we are moving forward with it in order to get this thing in progress uh, to show that these donors that, you know, there was good faith in what we wanted to do. But we have raised approximately $65,000 at this point. So we're excited about the opportunity, about developing a track at Buholtz. Uh, I appreciate everything that you all have done this evening and working with us. Uh, it's a good time. It's a good time. And I'd like to say one more thing, Mr. Purvis. I was hired at a job fair, and I'm a veteran. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Principal Tenvik. Mrs. Ward. Again, I'm Carmen Ward, ACA president, and I am so privileged to serve all of the employees in the bargaining unit, the bus drivers, the food service, the nurses, the, the aides, of course, our instructional staff, and I wanted to bring it to your attention that I was um, contacted, as was the district, this afternoon by the special magistrate in our impasse case. I want to remind everyone that at any time, we can choose not to be at impasse. We can choose to go back to the table, especially if the financial landscape has changed, which it is shifting in this spring semester. And so I just wanted to um, put that out there because the special magistrate, the earliest he can have a hearing with us is March 31st and he gave us dates through the end of April. And we haven't um, decided upon a date yet, but I do wanna say that um, I, I echo what Mr. Timbeg said that at the end of the day, we can always think about what is best for children in any decision that we're making. And what is best for children is what is best for those who serve the children in this district. And I know that this board has a long history of expressing that they want to do what is best for all of the employees in the district. And so um, that is why we just, you know, we had no choice, we felt, except to go to impasse when a proposal never changed from zero for our veteran ESPs, and that's our veteran bus drivers, food service. That is unacceptable. And that is not, um, and I'll keep saying that that was unacceptable. It was unaccept uh, unacceptable that that did not change, except for the bottom five steps um, of the lowest pay grade. All the veteran ESPs that, that have worked during COVID tirelessly um, deserve better. And deserve, it is our duty to do the best we can do for our employees. And so I just wanted to put that out there once more that 
we um, we are standing at impasse, but we are willing to, um, if there is movement, to, to reconsider that. That's all. Thank you, Mrs. Ward. Um, we are going to move to K on the CARES Act. So this was added to the agenda because I know we um, there are some CARES Act money still through the county and so the hope was that there could be some discussion for um, my staff and I to kind of approach the county and their CARES Act funding and um, start some discussions. Uh, we mentioned some of our concerns in the COVID protocol uh, or the response team presentation, contact tracing has become a bigger and bigger job the more our classes are being filled in the brick and mortar and so our principals specifically are spending more and more time contact tracing and um, less and less time actually being educational leaders in their building and so it would be um, it would be beneficial if we could look into opportunities to have some support with the contact tracing at the um, the building level and I I know I've heard other discussions and so pretty much our goal was to open this up for you all to talk so we can have some discussion items to address the county with madam chair yes um, well I'll just reiterate that um, I spoke with one of the commissioners and because we serve on the trust together Commissioner Cornell and asked them about um, any residual funds they had since the, the deadline to spend had been extended and um, asking what they could do to help us. And I think if we could hire additional personnel to help with the contact tracing um, at, to s address the issue that um, Superintendent Simon just mentioned, if we could possibly send a letter to the county with the things that we say they could help us with, that we think they could. So that's one thing I, I, I believe that they could help us with there uh, is financing or temporary positions for that to be able to, so that the principals and those don't have to do all of that tracking of that. That's one thing. And the increased cost, I think that's gonna be uh, for our board room equipment update is gonna be addressed at their next meeting. I think 220 or two, $230,000, $230, which is about $50,000 more than what they originally agreed to. So the additional amount will be, I think, discussed and hopefully approved at their next board meeting, but I'm, I'm anticipating that. But those are the two things that, that I've spoken to Commissioner Cornell about recently. Thank you. Yes. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'd just like to ask Dr. Simon uh, and whoever is working with you on this, if you could give us a little, I don't mean tonight, but I mean sometime in, in the coming week, uh, give us an idea of what you're expecting money-wise, what you're looking for, what are, what are your priorities. Uh, it's hard for me to discuss when I don't know what the options are, but uh, I'm, I'm sure you're on top of it. And if you could uh, let all of us know uh, what we're looking for for current funding and what what may be coming. So uh, that, that would be it. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So just to respond to that, um, so for the, the CARES Act money through the county, um, I would need to look or understand a bit more about what their budgetary component is. I'm assuming you're also talking about the stimulus yes. funding, the second component. We understand uh, that we know what monies are coming where we still are waiting, and I don't know when we will have an answer on this yet. We do not know the terms, nor do we understand um, what the allocation can actually be utilized for. So at this point, uh, regarding that, um, there's not much to share. Okay, thank you. Board member request. I don't I, Madam Chair, I do have uh, a request. Um, for one, I, I definitely, you know, being a new board member, one of the things I'm looking at is with the 21st century after school programs, um, 
the first thing, because I've talked to some teachers and visiting on my own in the past and things, um, teachers have complained about it being a babysitting service. Um, we have to make sure since we are responsible for the achievement gap. I don't want us to get lost in all of the other things that we're taking care of because our focus has to be the achievement gap. And so I spoke to one principal, a couple of principals, they choose to get involved as far as coordinating because they're watching on their camera and they can see that if the kids are supposed to be in the after school program, we want to make sure they're over there. What is the schedule? You know, what they're doing. Parents complain about not getting help with the homework. Uh, attendance was an issue, and I guess they need to stay the length of time. And so my concern is, and I don't know how when we get coordinators on site, how they are chosen or selected, but I would like to make sure, because this is an extended arm, and, 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 and with COVID and all of the things we've been dealing with, uh, behavior used to be an issue, but at one particular school, they've done a great job of it. But as we move forward, I want that accountability piece. We're not just getting, you know, people, we spend a lot of money in our DA schools, and so we need the results. As you know, the achievement gap has gotten wider and wider. So as we move forward, I'm really going to be looking at accountability as far as hiring people. They need to be able to help us with these phonics, getting these children prepared and where they need to be reading. Because the first thing it says, the goals of the project discovery are threefold. And the first one, number one, increase the number of students performing at grade level in reading. We got to have help with that. And then that's another option is about behavior. We've got to help when kids are engaged and they can read, you will see a decrease in behavior. And so I would also like to get a copy. I'm not sure, Madam Chair, uh, from my understanding, um, and speaking with Chief Jones, we used to, I don't know if we used to do the, uh, have teachers or have the contract with juvenile justice where the kids were learning. When I went to court, I asked um, Judge uh, Bullard asked, what are they doing during the day? They're supposed to be 8.30 to 2.30 doing their work. That's why I would like a presentation. Maybe that may need to be a presentation from System of Care or Mr. Brown. My understanding is he was in court. Um, uh, that day, but didn't know who Mr. Brown was. And so now that I know, I'm going to try to coordinate to meet with him as well as, uh, as Ms. Um, Carter. Spoke to her briefly already. But, because there's a pattern, when it, what I saw in court, all these kids at 15 to 17 half years of age are being charged with felonies. And some people didn't even know. If you stick your hand in somebody's car, and it's not your car, and they can pick up a penny, that's, that, that's a burglar charge. Now they got a felony at a young age. And they're all connected to the systems. We used to have a program uh, called Conflict Resolutions that Mr. Pelham did at Gaines, at Eastside High School, that everybody told me, the AS officer said that was a wonderful program. And I asked Mr. Pelham why did that program fail, or it was no longer, he said, because he got tired of begging for money. And so we got to start investing in this. We have too many shootings and murders, and so it's a sense of urgency. We've got to do better when it comes to all children, because one little boy, if he would have been allowed and spoke to his mother, if he would have been allowed to be in the um, culinary arts program at Eastside High School, he probably would not have been in trouble. And that's what I'm talking about, us being selective, and we know we have to do a better job. We're talking about all children. As somebody who's been involved since 1992, uh, this has been heavy on my heart. We're going to start making sure we're investing in every child. We need a renaissance movement. When you talk about money and all of these things, that's why it's important that we start looking at what we may have to merge and cut. Cut because we got to invest in human capital. If I'm if a child is after school, and they're there till six o'clock. That is a time for, for us to catch them up with their reading. If a child is in DJJ, we don't want them creating criminals because we can do all this alternative, get them out of high school, but if they're not prepared, they get into a world of crime, it gets dangerous. So we got to be able to work with our families, but I want a copy of, I don't know what happened to the contract with DJJ or what, because if they're at, in juvenile detention, 
21 days, that's a lot of time to work with someone on phonics and help them get their reading up. Because every child, and I also had her ask the question in court, could they read? Every child that can't, and people are not gonna tell you when they can't read, that's embarrassing. And so we have to do a better job. So as we move forward, those, you know, um, Dr. Simon, are some concerns that I have. T uh, 21st century, I want accountability. And then us working on launching Enough is Enough campaign here in Alachua, in Alachua County. Thank you. Madam Chair. Yeah, so how you have yeah, any? Yeah, uh, Madam Chair, I, I just have something real brief. Uh, um, I brought a copy of the uh, agenda for the special meeting for December 4th. I have copies if anybody wants them. I don't think you need them. But the agenda was very clear. A special school board meeting has been scheduled for consideration of interim superintendent. Well, we did that. Uh, it was done in three days. Uh, and uh, clear choice. Uh, and then somehow we, we moved from interim superintendent to superintendent. And, uh, and I don't think that's a transparent uh, action. And I don't think it's an action that, that was advertised for, for, for community input. This is not a superintendent issue. This is a board issue. Uh, so what my request uh, and because we, we had always, before the December 15th meeting, we'd always talked about having a superintendent search. And, and, and what I'd like to do is have a workshop uh, where we discuss this uh, and, uh, and move ahead with uh, choosing a permanent superintendent. And, and um, so my only request is that the chair and the superintendent uh, consider uh, consider this request and get back to me at some point about a uh, about a workshop. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. And um, there are no other announcements or no other requests from any other board members. All hearts are clear. Uh, we'll adjourn the meeting. I will say Dr. McNeely had to leave out to, to do get pick up her meds. So okay. she's okay. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.